Good morning. Good morning. My name is Richard Hanley. I'm the director of the Brooklyn Waterfront Research Center. And thank you for, uh, and welcome. Thank you for coming and welcome to our annual conference. Uh, today's uh, conference is Hospitality in the Time of Plague. In, in March uh, 2020, uh, we have been working to schedule a conference on hospitality um, in uh, for the BWRC. And uh, in March 2020 came the pandemic, the city closed down, and the conference was canceled. So here we are back again with another conference on hospitality, but this time the emphasis is uh, uh, quite different from the one that uh, we would have uh, seen in 2020. Uh, the pandemic has certainly uh, changed things. And so unlike uh, the last um, uh, conference, we now have a section on surviving the pandemic and how restaurants did that. Uh, we will have uh, speakers talking about uh, uh, delivery workers and how essential they were during the pandemic and how uh, those workers are uh, being treated and their working conditions today. Uh, it is a dangerous and uh, uh, hard uh, job that they do, uh, one that the city declared during the depths of the pandemic as an essential uh, service. They were essential workers. Um, we saw today uh, how, uh, or yesterday rather, how dangerous it can be. Um, someone was convicted and sentenced for murdering a delivery worker in 19, and I'm sorry, in 2021, uh, Francisco uh, Viava, uh, and that person received a 40 year to life uh, sentence. And we will see, we will hear from uh, a, a group, Las Deliveratas Unidas, who are working uh, for those uh, delivery workers. And then we'll have a section called uh, looking at the future of the restaurant industry and where it will be going and what it will look like uh, as we go forward. Um, the title, as I mentioned, is Hospitality in a Time of Plague. And that word hospitality um, it has a noble and uh, ancient uh, uh, term. Actually, uh, an earlier, uh, uh, the word in Greek is xenia. We hear xenophobia and uh, from that. But at any rate, xena was the uh, word for hospitality, and it was a cultural imperative to offer hospitality and to obey laws of hospitality. And those of you who... Uh, know are familiar with uh, Greek literature, for instance, the Odyssey has a very, um, uh, that uh, it's a theme, major theme that runs through that work. And you have character Odysseus who returns to his own home disguised as a beggar to see how the suitors will treat him. And they treat him uh, poorly as they find out uh, and to their chagrin that it is actually the owner of the house whose uh, hospitality they are abusing. Even in the Old Testament, you have Lot uh, who offers uh, who offers hospitality to to angels disguised as angels disguised as strangers. And uh, when others um, uh, abuse those strangers who are angels. Uh, Lot turns out to be the only one who he and his family uh, survived the destruction of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, and so God's coming down as disguised and looking for hospitality is an ancient, ancient theme. And I wonder perhaps um, restaurateurs treating their guests uh, with hospitality 
and wondering if one of those guests might be a god or a restaurant critic who would be like a god for uh, some of those. At any rate, um, that term hospitality is ancient. It's a noble profession, and it is one we're going to be looking at uh, in some detail today. And now we should start. I would like to introduce a uh, a, a friend uh, of mine, a friend of the Brooklyn Waterfront Research Center, uh, Emily Holloway, who's going to give the keynote talk. Emily is the guest research fellow of, of uh, the Brooklyn Waterfront Research Center for 2023. She um, left us to pursue a PhD uh, at Clark University, where she's an ABD, all but dissertation. And that dissertation is on Domino in the Long Durée, uh, Racial Capitalism and the Urban Question. And she comes back to the Brooklyn Waterfront for her dissertation because she's exploring the prehistory of the Domino Sugar Refinery in Brooklyn, now a housing development. Uh, but she looks at that uh, ancient, rather old, uh, sugar refinery through the lens of Caribbean sugar slavery in the 19th century. Uh, Emily is a uh, graduate in uh, from an urban policy. She has a master's from Hunter College in that subject. She's also got a bachelor's degree in government from Smith College. Um, and it is our pleasure to welcome her back to the Brooklyn Waterfront Research Center, where she's going to deliver her uh, her address to us as a research fellow. Thank you, and Emily. Great, thank you, Richard. All right, I'm just gonna get my screen share ready. Um, so good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to this talk. Um, I'd like to extend a huge thank you to Richard Hanley for planning and organizing this conference, along with uh, the other staff at BWRC, and reconciling all of the planning work from 2020 with this year's convenings. For those of you who know him, Richard is exceptionally skilled at networking and bringing people together. I had the privilege of working with him, as he mentioned, back in 2018 to 2019 as a project coordinator here, and he's been an important support in the years since. It's been an honor to work as a research fellow twice now at BWRC, which I think always punches above its weight as an institution at CUNY. I'd also like to thank Jasmine Blackburn, uh, who helped to produce some extremely helpful GIS maps for this project um, and provided some very valuable feedback on the white paper, as well as uh, Joseph Colombo, who helped with all of the logistical planning and getting everyone here today. So thanks, everybody. Um, I should also mention that although the 2020 version of this conference paper would have attempted to cover both food services and accommodation on the Brooklyn waterfront, this year I've opted to narrow my attention to just food services and restaurants. Finally, it's important to note that this research is meant to be the first and not the last word on these questions. This is a wide-angled uh, research framework that explores the restaurant industry, and I think it deserves a dedicated mixed methods uh, research agenda to fully understand the conditions and challenges that I mentioned. So as Richard has already explained to you, I'm a PhD candidate in urban geography at Clark University. And he also mentioned my, my research project, which is on an element of the Brooklyn waterfront, the Domino Sugar Refinery, and its connections to the political economy of slavery in the Caribbean plantation complex. So you might be wondering why I was asked to write the conference's white paper and deliver this talk. Um, in my previous life, I was a professional chef. I attended culinary school after getting my undergraduate degree and trained in kitchens in Austin, Napa, Philadelphia, and New York City. For close to a decade, I worked my way up in different kitchens, starting from the bottom of the line every time. For the last half of my cooking career, I worked for a restaurant group called Cook and Solo, which is based in Philadelphia. You may be familiar with their restaurant Zahav, which has won multiple James Beard Awards. 
When I left the industry in 2017, I was the executive chef of Dizengoff, a sister restaurant to Zahav. But when I started with the company back in 2012, I worked the station known as Cold Side, or the Cold Appetizer and Salad Station. I worked my way down the line, executing the same recipes and plating every day, cleaning and organizing my station the exact same way every day, showing up before lunch and leaving long after midnight every day. I'm intimately familiar with the demanding rhythms of work in a restaurant kitchen. It is relentless, often tedious, and physically and emotionally taxing work. I was fortunate to work in a kitchen that did not tolerate most of the toxic excess you might see on TV, but the work was still the work. Manual labor, poorly paid, and under extraordinarily high pressure to perform. Profit margins in the restaurant industry are notoriously narrow, rarely exceeding 5%. Menu prices account for more than just the food and labor costs that go into a meal. They also include overhead costs like rent, utilities, property insurance and taxes, equipment maintenance, and the invisible but vital labor from office and administrative staff. Labor typically composes the largest share of costs in the restaurant, in the average restaurant, with a conservative industry standard around 30%. <clears throat> My experiences in this industry will always shape how I look at work in general and restaurants in particular. This work is largely out of sight and hidden from its customers. It's not just the line cooks, but also the day prep cooks, dishwashers, porters, butchers, bussers, runners, servers, and more. A restaurant is a political economy in miniature, an ecosystem that is finely tuned to economize every second of time on the clock, every potato peel, every drop of wine. It is a delicate and vulnerable system. This kind of fragility was exposed immediately as the pandemic set in during the winter of 2020, particularly in New York. Hundreds of thousands of restaurant workers were unemployed practically overnight. A raft of ad hoc social safety net systems, some federal, some state, some local, and some through mutual aid, were organized and implemented. But for many, these programs were not enough to sustain either workers or businesses. Workers faced an impossible choice to either risk their health and continue working or pray that un expanded unemployment payments would keep coming. Many workers in the industry, whether those making the food or delivering it, continued to feed quarantined individuals and families across the country. The stark divisions of class and race were amplified by the muddled designation of essential workers, a category that, for a brief moment, valued the labor of doctors alongside sanitation workers, line cooks, and bus drivers. For those members of our economy who could not opt out of going to work in person, being essential also meant being at risk. For some to stay safe in their apartments, quarantined from the spread, many others had to keep the city running, to keep supply lines open, and to keep the rest of us comfortable. Those essential workers who, whether by choice or necessity, opted to work through the pandemic, absorbing risks that the rest of us wouldn't have to. For this conference, it was my task to investigate one small sliver of this group, restaurant workers. But to understand the broader implications of those experiences and how they've brought us to the landscape of today, I think it's important to emphasize the extent of growth and hospitality, particularly in Brooklyn, but especially along parts of the waterfront in the decade leading up to COVID. As my research documents, the industry was a significant part of Brooklyn and New York's overall employment and economic landscape. Exogenous shocks like the pandemic and lockdowns had an outsized effect on the overall economy and landscape of the city. My research is titled From Surplus to Scarcity. This refers mainly to the last three years and examines how a surplus of unemployed restaurant workers laid off or fired during the pandemic transformed their labor into a scarce resource that continues to shape the experience of eating at and working in restaurants across the country. <clears throat> My perspective on the crisis in the restaurant industry is informed by geographer Ruth Wilson Gilmore's definition in her study of California's carceral political economy. She says, quote, crisis means instability that can be fixed only through radical measures, including developing new relationships and new or renovated institutions out of what already exists. She goes on to explain that when certain capacities, 
people and capital are idled or rendered as surplus, the underlying fragility of a system is exposed and primed for change. Surplus and crisis both come from a single, extremely complicated relationship. If surplus cannot be channeled into new outlets, whether by investing capital into new businesses or places, channeling state capacity into new social programs, or by rearranging relations of labor, a crisis is the outcome of surplus. By focusing specifically on labor and class more generally, I hope to tease out some threads and continuities that connect my pre-COVID historical research on Brooklyn's hospitality industry to my work today. In that paper, I synthesized the history of Brooklyn's restaurant and accommodation services, from the humble hot dog stand to the elite and segregated resorts of the South Brooklyn waterfront. These services reflected and reproduced historical attitudes and norms around class, race, and gender, and the trends today follow a similar path. So today I'll briefly review some of the key highlights of that historical research to share a vivid picture of these contrasts. Then I'll jump ahead several decades into the Bloomberg era to see how the golden age of restaurants in this borough emerged from a concentrated effort to restructure and deindustrialize Brooklyn's economy. I'll look at data on restaurant growth and related changes in the labor market. Then we'll get to the month when the world felt like it stopped, March 2020. I'll review some of the larger trends and outcomes of the lockdowns in New York, including an increase in food delivery services, ghost kitchens, outdoor dining programs, and employment patterns between March 2020 and the summer of 2021. Then to provide some background on our current context, I'll look at how a variety of stakeholders from restaurant workers to unions, to policymakers and private investors have worked to leverage and challenge some of these transitions as day-to-day -day life resumes a semblance of normalcy. Based on my personal and professional experience in kitchens, I have to emphasize that returning to normal or the status quo is not the right answer. It is imperative that researchers and policymakers remain vigilant about the fragility of restaurants as a business model and keep exploring alternative and systemic strategies to change them. Normal isn't good enough. A sleepy bedroom community for much of the 18th and early 19th centuries Brooklyn's waterfront is deeply tied to its industrial heritage. The ad hoc economies that supported factory and dock workers included boarding houses, saloons, brothels, food carts, and amusement parks, and they drew a stark contrast to those of the factory and shipyard owners who spent lavishly at seaside resorts, fine hotels, and restaurants. The legacy of Brooklyn's industrial profile, which is visible now in the stylish complex of brick and paned glass warehouses that have been converted into hotels and retail space, symbolizes a complex convergence of elite power and working class taste, one underwritten by dynamic patterns of immigration and global economic transition. To understand the landscape of tourism, cuisine, and entertainment along Brooklyn's waterfront today, one must look to their earliest iterations. Coney Island and Brighton Beach, Williamsburg and Brooklyn Heights, Greenpoint and Sheepshead Bay. The impact of global economic restructuring that followed World War II translated unevenly on the landscape of Brooklyn's eateries and hotels, but the underlying mechanics and logics of value, consumption, and capital assimilated these variations into a powerful and global brand, the new Brooklyn. Although the success of the new Brooklyn appears to be an organic convergence of timing, taste, and entrepreneurship, the structural changes enabled by public policy in the early 2000s ensured that this economic transformation would have a lasting impact on Brooklyn's waterfront. This drastic shift in economic patterns in Brooklyn is the consequence of many different factors, including the 2007 and 8 economic recession, former Mayor Bloomberg's wholesale rezoning of vast swaths of industrial land, and more generally, an uptick in tourism to New York City and Brooklyn over the last 15 years. A 2005 report titled Initiative for a Competitive Brooklyn, Seizing Our Moment, focused on four industry employment clusters primed for economic expansion and development to revitalize Brooklyn, one of which includes hospitality, tourism, and entertainment. 
The language invoked by the authors to boost the profile of Brooklyn is revealing. Introducing the case for Brooklyn as a cultural destination, they write, Brooklyn is a brand that is recognized nationally and internationally. Their recommendations for sustained sectoral growth in hospitality and entertainment are contingent on cultivating and maintaining a specific brand image that can be broadcast to consumers around the world. This economic development platform, along with the 2005 rezoning of 180 blocks in Williamsburg and Greenpoint, repositioned the economy of Brooklyn's waterfront away from manufacturing and towards services and hospitality. Restaurant openings in Brooklyn outpaced other sources of private employment during the years after the, the 2007 and 8 financial crisis and mirrored the significant demographic changes across the borough since the early 2000s. By 2019, the restaurant industry in New York City accounted for roughly one in 12 private sector jobs and establishments citywide. During the decade between 2011 and 19, the number of dining establishments in Brooklyn increased by nearly 50%, higher than the citywide rate over the same period. However, average annual pay for workers in Brooklyn's restaurants, including full service establishments, fast food, counter service, and bars, hovered below $25,000 a year until 2016. Employee turnover in restaurants has always been infamously high. Low pay, long hours, and high pressure working environments in the front and back of house are common factors for turnover. But the rapid expansion of dining establishments in Brooklyn may have also created conditions for worker mobility. Although this data is not publicly available at the county or census tract level, the national number of monthly quits was on a steady increase between 2012 and 2020, reaching an unprecedented high of over 830,000 in 2019. That same year, Brooklyn had a total of over 5,000 dining establishments. I think that this bubble in business growth, which created high demand for labor, may account for both the highs in worker pay that year um, as well as increased turnover and mobility. This correlation, however, also left the borough particularly vulnerable to sector-wide shocks and crises. In March 2020, this vulnerability proved devastating for restaurant workers and owners across the country. The first reported and confirmed case of COVID-19 in New York was announced by former Governor Andrew Cuomo on March 1st, 2020. Only a few weeks later, on March 16th, a prohibition on indoor dining was announced. Businesses scrambled to adjust to this new reality as quickly as possible, and a range of new strategies were developed to maintain revenue. Hundreds of restaurants closed outright. Thousands struggled to adapt to the new reality. Several different strategies helped restaurant owners and operators cope with these constraints, but these adaptations had significant and sometimes devastating effects on the workers who carried them out. Restaurants adapted as quickly as possible to convert their dining rooms into takeout fulfillment centers, working with a skeleton crew of cooks and support staff to meet demand. Even high-end Michelin star restaurants like Brooklyn Fair transitioned to delivery service, offering three course meals to go. Williamsburg Institution Peter Luger sold burgers and sides, its world famous porterhouse steak, and even raw steaks to go. These new configurations and service depend on a veritable army of low wage drivers. By 2021, the estimated number of delivery workers in New York City reached a staggering 80,000. Classified as independent contractors, delivery workers are not counted as employees of the restaurants they deliver for or the third party apps that coordinate them. As private contractors, delivery drivers are typically responsible for purchasing and maintaining their own vehicles, equipment, and setting their own schedules. This economic vulnerability translates to significant physical vulnerability for couriers. In addition to the increased risk of COVID infection while traveling back and forth across the city, couriers also report instances of assault and robbery while on the job, as well as accidents with cars. They're also responsible for their own medical care and workman's comp. A survey conducted by the Workers' Justice Project and the Worker Institute of Cornell University's ILR School found that on average, 
Couriers earn around $12.21 an hour, including tips. As the authors note, tips are a highly unpredictable income stream for any service worker. If you exclude average tips, the average hourly income for a courier is only $7.87 an hour, roughly half the minimum wage in New York. Couriers have also reported that the algorithms of delivery platforms rely on performance evaluation that is informed by customer reviews and their acceptance records. This approach incentivizes drivers to move faster, work longer and harder, and take fewer breaks to raise their status in the app and earn more money. The geography of dining has transformed since 2020. Restaurant kitchens are no longer located at just one address, able to seat just so many tables or covers every night. Instead, the restaurant has become a mobile, untethered, and highly rationalized operation, whose dining room has expanded far beyond the physical confines of a brick and mortar space. Another important innovation to the geography of dining has been the growth of so-called ghost kitchens or cloud kitchens. These operations are enmeshed with the platform-based economy of food delivery. Ghost kitchens function as commissary spaces, sometimes shared among different establishments, that can mass produce ready-to-eat meals based on a streamlined menu. There is no dining room, no front of house staff, no wine list, no coat check. These operations dissolve the line between food manufacturing and dining and leverage their kitchen space to serve a wider customer base at a higher rate of production. <clears throat> One important innovation that came from policymakers during the pandemic included the city's outdoor dining program, which is still being debated for permanent implementation by the city council. According to research by the RPA and the Alfresco NYC coalition, the expansion of outdoor dining opportunities in New York since 2020 has preserved at least 100,000 jobs. The distribution of dining establishments with open streets permits, however, is unevenly distributed across the city. A report from the New York State Comptroller noted that despite being the largest borough by population, Brooklyn restaurants make up just under 25% of all licenses. Of this share, nearly 50% of these establishments are in just three neighborhoods. Greenpoint Williamsburg, uh, the Brooklyn Heights Fort Greene neighborhood, and Park Slope Carroll Gardens. In mid-March 2020, the state government also authorized restaurants to sell alcoholic beverages to go, provided they were accompanied by food. Restaurants with bar programs sold everything from house cocktails to classics by the glass and in bulk. That spring, New Yorkers could enjoy their cocktails, wine, and beer outside, socially distanced, while they ate their takeout meals. This strategy was surely a lifeline for many restaurants, some of whom also turned to wine retail to maintain revenue during the lockdowns. In April 2022, the state government passed legislation to continue the program for another three years. This strategy will surely be a boon to the state's sales and liquor tax base, which declined by 71% between March and May of 2020. But perhaps more than any other business strategy adaptation, the massive federal spending packages passed by Congress during the pandemic were critical to support restaurant workers during lockdowns and in the months after. Multiple overlapping programs provided financial support to workers and business owners including the Paycheck Protection Program, the Restaurant Revitalization Fund, unemployment insurance, and economic impact payments. Although these programs undoubtedly supported thousands of hospitality workers and business owners, the benefits were still unevenly distributed. For example, 30% of RRF loans in Brooklyn were approved for Greenpoint Williamsburg, Brooklyn Heights, Fort Greene, and the Borough Park and Kensington neighborhoods. These three neighborhoods made up a quarter of all RRF loans in the city. By the end of the program in June 2021, a total of 1,333 loans totaling $383 million have been awarded to restaurants across Brooklyn. Nationally, 101,000 loan awards were approved before the program expired, with roughly 10% of those for restaurants located in New York. PPP loans, which were available to businesses with fewer than 500 employees, were also unevenly distributed. In New York, the restaurant industry's share of PPP loans was only 9%, a full point below their share of all small businesses in the city. 
In Brooklyn, nearly 2,500 loans were approved, targeting 21,000 jobs. This jobs number, however, represented just 43% of all restaurant jobs in the borough, the second lowest share in the city after the Bronx. By comparison, Staten Island's approved PPP loans supported 60% of restaurant jobs, and Manhattan's reached nearly 51% of their labor force. So overall, only 45.6% of uh, small businesses in New York received PPP loans, compared to a national average of 51%. Although the number of these loans was comparatively modest for Brooklyn-based food service establishments, the number of establishments between 2019 and 2020 only went down by 85 and recovered over 50 new establishments by 2021. But as a longitudinal national study uh, published earlier this year has demonstrated, black owned businesses were the most vulnerable to closure and lower revenue during the pandemic, despite these support programs. Across industries, unemployment skyrocketed during the first several months of the pandemic. This chart illustrates the steep increase in unemployment claims in Brooklyn directly after historic lows in 2018 to 19. Unemployment insurance was a crucial but wildly insufficient source of support for workers during the pandemic. For example, the average city waiter earning $39,000 a year, which was the local average in 2019, would be eligible for only $380 a week in unemployment benefits, which works out to roughly half of their annual salary. For cooks whose wages are lower than servers, their monthly unemployment benefits would amount to only $300 a week. Importantly, undocumented residents are not eligible for these benefits and were also not eligible for stimulus checks in 2020 and 2021. Although a short-term program called the Excluded Workers Fund, which had $2.1 billion to support these residents, did provide limited assistance during the program's brief tenure. Many of these workers then returned to work in high restaurant, or excuse me, high risk environments such as restaurants during the pandemic, whether they worked behind the line or in front of the line or on their bikes. Indeed, estimates for COVID-19 mortality rates in 2020 among accommodation and food service workers reached 55 for every 100,000 workers, compared to an average mortality rate of 28.3 per 100,000 workers across all industry groups. In Brooklyn, nearly 13,000 individuals were reported to have died from COVID-19 between February 2020 and March 2022. This chart here analyzes the number of deaths and their risk ratio for selected occupations in a sample study performed in California in 2020. The risk ratio for cooks is highest at 1.6. So in other words, for individuals whose occupation is cook, every one death in non-pandemic times equals 1.6 deaths during COVID. Unsurprisingly, hospitality businesses, particularly in food service, have struggled to retain staff at pre-pandemic levels. For the labor market, perhaps the most dramatic outcome of the pandemic has been a chronic labor shortage across multiple industries, including hospitality, healthcare, pre-K through 12 education, care work, and retail. Many of these restaurants or, or industries are characterized by high turnover, low pay, unpredictable schedules, and demanding work environments. They were also acutely affected by the spread of coronavirus because many of these occupations require in-person work. In 2022, the total number of quits nationwide in accommodation and food services reached a staggering 9.2 million. This transition from a surplus of restaurant workers at the height of the pandemic to a near scarcity today presents a major shift in bargaining power for workers, new opportunities for labor organizing, and potential avenues for, sy for systemic change in restaurant operations. There has been meaningful progress and broad support for unionization campaigns in many kinds of service sectors over the last several years, including graduate students, platform-based logistics like Amazon warehouses, tech, and restaurant services. In my white paper, I, I outline a few of the more high-profile campaigns, such as Starbucks and Chipotle, that may provide much-needed momentum to galvanize restaurant organizing at smaller scales. 
Indirectly, the pandemic brought lasting challenges to dining culture and cuisine. The labor shortage presents direct challenges to traditional menus, hours, and service options. A chef's ability to offer a specific menu is, de is dependent on a range of factors, their budget, the skill level and availability of cooks, the season, and customer preferences. The pressures of the pandemic and the subsequent lockdowns induce significant changes to, cons to consumer taste, with a greater emphasis on fast casual options that could be picked up and eaten without face-to-face -face contact. The labor shortage has also affected the complexity and breadth of menus, as fewer cooks and servers try to meet the same level of demand. Finally, some food writers have dubbed Thursday the new Friday for restaurant diners, as hybrid and flexible work from home arrangements typically fall on Fridays. Diners prefer to eat out at the end of their in-office work week rather than on a Friday at home. In addition to menu changes, more restaurants have uh, limited their schedules by closing completely on Sundays and Mondays, and that minimizes the need to hire additional staff. More recently, supply chain snarls and inflation have forced restaurateurs and chefs to hoard certain ingredients like cocoa powder. Another poignant example um, was the exorbitant cost of eggs last winter, a consequence of an avian flu outbreak in 2022 that saw over 43 million egg producing chickens killed to contain the virus. This has also forced breakfast restaurants and bakeries to raise their prices. As these price constraints, including uh, increased labor costs, continue to accelerate, restaurant owners and chefs may innovate new dining and service protocols to mitigate their costs. Adding additional tables and promoting takeout to increase the number of covers every night without increasing the square footage of, a, of their establishment may mitigate these costs without raising prices. However, there are concerns within the industry that a potential recession is imminent. Diners may be less, less willing to spend their disposable income on dining out over the next year. So I'm gonna start wrapping up here. Um, I did wanna share uh, this map um, that Jasmine Blackburn has put together. Um, so we estimated uh, using restaurant inspection records from the Department of Health here in New York, um, this was as of February, 2023, that there are 4,455 restaurants within the Brooklyn waterfront study area today. So we define that as any census tract whose center is within one mile of the waterfront. Um, on this map, uh, we're illustrating their distribution relative to the median income of each census tract. The highest concentration of restaurants, unsurprisingly, falls in Greenpoint, Williamsburg, Brooklyn Heights, and downtown Brooklyn. Uh, many of these neighborhoods have gentrified significantly over the past several decades, or like Brooklyn Heights, have long been stable upper middle class communities. So to wrap up, um, you know, I believe that restaurants have been in crisis for much longer than the pandemic. And I think restaurant workers understand that. The years 2020 to 2022 were devastating to the industry, but those shocks of mass closure, layoffs, and a stilted return to normal operations is indicative of the industry's systemic fragility under the status quo. To preserve the best things about restaurants, the shared and dynamic public spaces, creative and, inter uh, and traditional interpretations of cuisine, and a diverse economy, Restaurant owners and customers should carefully consider and accurately value the vital infrastructure that underwrites them. The chefs, line cooks, dishwashers, bussers, barbacks, surfers, hosts, porters, and prep cooks that do this work every day. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. We really appreciate that and uh, people, each of each of you has uh, received a, a PDF link to uh, or PDF copy of Emily's paper, and you could read this in uh, some detail. If there are any questions, uh, you could use the Q and A uh, function uh, with that. So, Emily, are you um, are are you optimistic that? Uh, that the restaurant industry will 
thrive or it will thrive in certain places and not in others? Or how do you see the uh, future of the industry? Well, I think it'll come back. I think that there's just enough demand. Um, the demand is there from customers and diners. And I think foodie culture is still very much a part of popular culture. Um, but by thrive, it, it's really a question of who's thriving and how are they thriving. Um, I just think that the, I'm, I'm optimistic, I think about the momentum of all the labor organizing that I mentioned, um, but it's gonna be difficult to get those campaigns going in small restaurants that have a staff of you know five to 10 people maybe. Um, it's, it's just difficult to get that going. Um, people are very risk averse, um, especially if they don't have a backup plan. Um, and so I think, you know, it's gonna be a long road, but I'm hoping that all of the momentum behind these larger corporate organizing movements um, might inspire some, some change in these smaller scales. Did what in term in of the various programs that were instituted during the um, during the pandemic, uh, which do you think helped the most? And I guess that in, in, in part of that question would be who did what programs help the most? So some that might have helped restaurant owners, some that might have helped uh, restaurant investment corporations, some that might have helped workers. So do you have uh, some opinions about that? Yeah, I think um, I think they were all helpful. Like, I don't think any of them did any harm. I think one, uh, the ones that did the most good, I think just outright and for the most people were um, the economic impact payments that everybody received, well, not everybody, but everybody uh, with legal work permissions uh, was able to receive along with the um, there was a bump in unemployment payments as well that unemployed workers were able to access for a good part of the pandemic. Um, and I'm sure, like, I know that that helped a lot of people because we've been seeing research coming out from uh, looking at the, um, uh, the effect that that had on the poverty rate just across the country. And you can see immediately that how many people that lifted out of poverty. Um, I think the PPP loans, just, I didn't have to participate in this. Luckily, I had already left the industry, but it seemed like it was quite a headache for everyone involved um, and just not a very efficient way to get support out quickly um, by contracting with private banks and loans. Um, the uh, Excluded Workers Fund was a great idea and I'm really glad that that went through, but it didn't seem to go very far. It was only in, in place for three months by the time the- you explain the, what that was? The Excluded Workers Fund. Yeah, that was, um, and Jasmine brought this to my attention while we were working through the revisions. Um, so this fund was meant for, uh, for workers and residents in New York who were ineligible for the federal programs that I mentioned because they're not um, of the the citizenship, citizenship status that was required. Um, but rather than leave them out entirely, they were able to secure, I think it was, I mentioned it in the paper, but close to $4 billion total. Um, but the applications were a little cumbersome for a lot of people to complete. Not everyone knew about them. Um, and the money did run out very quickly and it was not renewed for another term. So um, I think if that had been a little bit more substantial or implemented more carefully and thoughtfully, um, maybe it would have had a longer impact. Okay, um, thank you so much. So would you, in final question, would you have uh, gone into the industry uh, <laughs> again? <laughs> All things, if you were where you were yeah. a number of years ago, would you have uh, done that, knowing what you know now? Yeah, I think about that a lot, actually. And I don't know if it's helpful to be regretful about things like that. Um, Philosophical, think, good. Sure. Um, but I, I, I don't think I would be where I am today if I hadn't gone through that. I don't think I would 
have the same attitude about work and teamwork, especially um, the same kind of pragmatism and practicality that I try to bring to my life um, and just establishing structure and thinking through things and not to mention like learning, learning how to cook is pretty, is a pretty great skill to have and to share with people. So no, I don't think I would do it differently. Okay, so uh, thank you for continuing to be uh, helpful to the Brooklyn Waterfront Research Center by serving as a scholar, by doing this presentation, by writing the paper. And I've been told to mention that also there's a link to your paper uh, online. And um, so thank you and uh, good luck on your uh, PhD thesis, and uh, we'll have you come back for a breakfast talk on uh, the Domino sugar plant when you are done with that. Great. Thank you, Richard. This was great. Okay. And so now uh, we will uh, proceed to our uh, next uh, uh, group. It's our uh, first panel of the day. And uh, for this panel, we're going to hear in more detail some of the things that Emily uh, touched upon. Uh, we have uh, three people who were involved in various uh, efforts during the pandemic. Uh, our first uh, panelist who's going to speak, um, it will be Robert Bookman. And by the way, with the panel we'll go through, we'll have each of the panelists uh, speak, and then uh, uh, you can ask questions uh, through the Q&A uh, function that you have, and we will uh, do the questions and the discussion at the end of uh, at, at the end of the panel, rather than at the end of each uh, each speaker's presentation. So the first uh, speaker is going to be Robert Bookman, who is a recognized leader of the New York hospitality industry. Uh, he specializes in representing the industry. He's an attorney and uh, first as the uh, co-founder and counsel to the New York Nightlife Association and now as the counsel to its successor organization, the New York Hospitality Alliance. Um, Robert is a nationally recognized expert on nightlife business and organizational issues and is a frequent speaker at regional and national conferences. And we are really uh, pleased and proud to have him uh, here with us at the Brooklyn Waterfront Research Center and to share his observations uh, about surviving the pandemics. Robert. Thank you, Richard. Thank you for the introduction. You left out one important factor, second generation born and bred in Brooklyn. Ah, okay. Sorry about that. Very important. <laughs> uh, I have a sweatshirt that says my story starts in Brooklyn, you know. Um, okay. So uh, thank you. Uh, in, in, in addition to those uh, lofty titles, uh, I'm, I'm partner in a, uh, a New York City based uh, boutique law firm that specializes in representing the hospitality industry before government agencies is like the State Liquor Authority and the uh, City Health Department. So um, I've been working with small restaurant owners and uh, bar owners and um, boutique hotels for, for decades now. And uh, I do have to say that I don't think there's any industry where the owners care more about their team and more about their workers uh, than small restaurant owners. And um, they were essential workers as well because they, they were working seven days a week to keep their businesses going and try to keep some of their employees going. So before COVID, uh, we had a very minimum outdoor dining program historically in New York City. There were only about 1,200 licensed cafes throughout the entire city, and most of them were uh, in Manhattan. Uh, the concept of outdoor dining in the roadway uh, wasn't even an idea that anybody thought uh, uh, would ever be possible that some cars would be, park cars be replaced you know, by dining. Uh, the ability for restaurants to sell alcohol to go, uh, you know, with with a food item um, had been mentioned on and off over the decades and always shot down, uh, often by community boards and, uh, and NIMBYs, but more more regularly by a well-organized uh, liquor store industry that, that felt that that was going to be competition. Um, 
COVID changed all of those, those attitudes. Uh, restaurants, bars were the first to close and we were the last to open. And um, once we closed, I think there was a general recognition throughout the city and the state how essential it re we really were, especially since people weren't going, literally going out of their houses and their apartments in the first month or two, and they had to get food. Uh, and delivery became a huge, huge lifeline. Um, so we immediately were sitting down as a trade association with the city, with the state, and with the federal government uh, to craft a lot of these programs that Emily touched on. They didn't just happen. Uh, it was because of advocacy uh, you know, by groups like ours, the New York City Hospitality Alliance. Um, and fortunately, because um, the head of the uh, United States Senate Chuck Schumer is our senator and from Brooklyn, uh, we had a direct line to the federal government as well uh, when it came to uh, you know, necessary programs. So uh, on the city and state coordinating level, we immediately got an emergency expansion, major expansion of outdoor dining. You know, we said to the, to the governor Cuomo immediately as soon as we were shut down in March that from what we're reading about this disease, uh, this virus, it might be safer to eat outdoors sooner than it might be safe to eat indoors. So let's start working on an idea of getting restaurants to, uh, to be able to do that. And it took a while. And June 22nd was the first date of the emergency outdoor dining program. So we've been closed for two months already uh, with, you know, basically only takeout. Uh, devastating. Um, and and um, that program resulted in over 12,000 space restaurants around the city from 1,200 to 12,000 in every borough. It completely democratized outdoor dining and it introduced roadway dining for the first time in the history you know, of New York as well as some closed streets. Uh, and uh, it's been a huge successful program. Frankly, no one thought it would be lasting this long as an emergency, but it's been taking us a year now to negotiate between the council and the mayor what the permanent program will look like. And we're confident that um, uh, a democratic outdoor uh, dining program will be a permanent part of New York you know, going, going forward. Uh, so that's a major change as, as a result of COVID. Um, and drinks to go and wine to go is also a major change. As Emily mentioned, uh, it went from an emergency program to uh, being made lawful for three more years. Uh, the liquor stores seem to have uh, recognized that drinks to go you know, is not stopping people from buying at their liquor stores. So I think our major opposition has disappeared. And I'm hopeful that when the time comes, that law will be able to be made permanent as well. Um, alcohol in those roadway dinings, believe it or not, also required both city and state law to change because the state law does not allow alcohol to go from a restaurant across a public space. So we were very happy to see that state law change, basically saying if the city agrees to have alcohol in roadways, then the state liquor authority, you know, automatically agrees to it. So those were all emergency programs that we needed. And according to everybody's uh, data, it brought back 100,000 jobs uh, to uh, New York City restaurants, you know, a huge, a huge number and a huge lifeline to keep, keep our restaurants open and to keep our workers working. We were also at the forefront on these state programs to and federal programs, PPP, uh, Save the Stages started in New York, billions of dollars for live music venues, Broadway, other you know, comedy clubs. That started here in New York, our advocacy. Uh, the Restaurant Revitalization Fund, uh, we, we start, started advocating for that here in New York as well. Chuck Schumer got it passed. Unfortunately, it was underfunded and only 25% of New York City restaurants that were eligible for that restaurant re revitalization money were able to receive it. So at the end of the day, it was a help, but it was a big disappointment that it was underfunded, but it was underfunded because the Republicans refused to uh, give it the full money that it needed. Um, the biggest problem in all, and the PPP didn't work for restaurants because in many neighborhoods, they were closed. They weren't reopening. They weren't bringing all their employees back. They couldn't. And PPP required that you spend that money by a certain date, you know, on, on salary. So we were able to get a law passed giving an extension on, you know, one year extension on that. So when restaurants reopen, they could properly use the money uh, rather than just return it to the federal government. 
the biggest issue and the biggest disappointment, which would have made the industry whole faster, was the, the big insurance companies. Most small businesses have what's called business interrupted insur insurance. When your business closes for some reason or another, um, you know, you go to your business interruption insurance. So we all went, and this was a national issue, to all the insurance companies and saying, our business is closed. It's closed because of this disease, this pandemic. The government has forced us to be closed. Obviously, our business is being interrupted. They deny every single claim here in New York and throughout the country. And... Uh, there were tons of litigation and the courts have sided with the insurance companies. Uh, we had a day in Broadway where the lights went dark and we said insurance companies do the right thing. They did not. Um, and yeah, and that was a big disappointment. The excluded workers fund, um, Emily, that came from us. That came from the business owners who saw which of their employees were able to get unemployment insurance and that many of them were not. We have an excellent, we work as a team in restaurants. And uh, we went to the government and said, due to immigration status, many of our employees cannot get uh, the uh, unemployment and the other benefits that are being provided to workers. So we got that done. And that was a help you know, for many of our workers. Uh, the reality is some of the undocumented workers simply went back to their home countries and never returned to New York. So we're, you know, we're optimistic about the future. Uh, between outdoor dining, uh, new laws to include roadways, uh, making drinks permanent to go, uh, people want to eat out. I'd say the biggest concern we have are the big corporations that have their hands in our pockets, uh, the third-party delivery companies like Grubhub, the companies now, you know, where you have to use a third-party company to make a reservation at a restaurant, you know. Each of them are taking money out of a limited profit that restaurants are making. Uh, the answer uh, you know, uh, you know, with all due respect to Emily, is not making labor even more expensive, you know, at restaurants, but getting these third parties out, getting some government fines off our backs and letting entrepreneurs be entrepreneurs. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Robert, uh, for that. And I'm sure that we will have some questions for you at the end and Emily might have some questions for you about the uh the, the wages of of workers and and how that would uh think. you very you explained things very precisely and gave us a good overview so uh thank you very much and we'll okay. have questions at the end of the panel our next speaker uh, is is Joseph Corbin who is the the uh, the director? Um, oh, okay, he's here. Here we go. Joseph Corbin. He's the director of the American Institute of Architects, the New York chapter. Um, in the spring of 2020, uh, Joseph uh, co-founded the Design Corps along with members of uh, AIA New York, uh, New York Economic Development Corporation, and design advocates to help architects. Uh, and designers provide pro bono design services for the open restaurants programs. Uh, he'll tell us about those uh, outdoor facilities that we witness and how they came to be designed and came to be constructed. Between the summers of 2020 and 2021, the Design Corps assisted more than 100 restaurants across five boroughs. Uh, Joe's also the leader of the organization of the Open Restaurants Innovation Program. And so, Joseph, welcome and thank you very much for being here. Thank you so much, Richard, and, and um, for inviting me to speak on uh, the outdoor dining program here in New York City. This is uh, an exciting time for the program, as uh, Robert alluded to, as were, and Emily alluded to, that negotiations are still ongoing on to the permanent law that will uh, enact what the permanent program will be. So this is an exciting time to discuss what has already occurred and to sort of imagine and be in a position to imagine what the future of these streeteries uh, will look like. So um, my presentation will be a little bit briefer, but I think I'll go back to um, talking about what the design core is and, um, and what it plans to serve. So the Design Corps is a platform to connect architecture and design professionals to offer pro bono services 
uh, to specifically restaurants and also to some other small businesses um, struggling to meet um, these brand new regulations related to these outdoor structures. And to date, we've served about 100 restaurants and about a dozen businesses with over 100 architecture firms and designers to provide these services. And so um, just as, as Robert alluded to in June, when the open restaurants program was started by the DOT after a lot of pressure from the dining industry and also support from the uh, design industry um, with some test cases um, in the beginnings of the summer in the late spring of 2020, that's when the program began. And so shortly after that, in about August of 2020, um, the city and NYC EDC had come to us to ask for assistance in helping build out a pro bono program for architects and designers who had the time and had the expertise to provide these services generally free of charge. So the reason why they came to us in the first place after the program had launched was while it the city had effectively stripped away many of the zoning and code regulations to create open restaurants. It did come with new regulations that did cause a great amount of confusion that did result in, in some instances in some unsafe structures. Um, guidelines for allowable structures can be very exacting and precise even after the removal of a lot of these rules. There's still a lot of um, very precise rules that uh, were required to follow. Um, specific measurements, materials, placements, other technical rules that have to be met and or they would result in some pretty serious fines. And so restaurants, restaurateurs also struggle to meet these weight and size requirements for barriers in the road to construct these permissible tents that we've seen in the um, here in the city, roofs and structures placement of the dining setups that don't obstruct pedestrian pathways, um, avoid coverings of utility hardware, subway ventilation, manholes, parking meters. These, these are things that um, um, can be easy, easy to forget about when you're, when you're trying to quickly build out your, your basically your new dining setup in the, in, the, in the heart of the pandemic. So many businesses, especially in the neighborhoods most hardest hit by the pandemic, were really struggling to create these outdoor dining setups. So um, EDC and other, and other governments and nonprofit groups such as ours came together to develop the design core to help restaurants create their new outdoor dining spaces safely and with as little expenses as possible. And of course, without running afoul of regulations. So some re restaurants came to the design core for some soup to nuts assistance while others had you know really specific requests and needs on how to um, provide cost effective heating elements provide cost effective barrier replacements and the like um, so typically these the design professionals translated those questions and requests uh, into technical components to meet those requirements and mostly to help um, restaurants try and navigate the regulatory framework that was developed quickly by the city and was really constantly evolving by the city on a monthly basis. So many of these uh, rest, uh, of the design volunteers, however, I have to commend, really went above and beyond um, in, beyond offering these free advisory services and would help um, these restaurants with finding contractors, procuring materials, finding some materials for free to save them a net of sometimes upwards of 20, 25, $30,000. These structures, and while the, you know, acknowledging that these regulations and um, the removal of a lot of them made access to applying for the program quite equitable and how, you know, cost effective it was, the cost of these structures to make them safe, to, to, in, in, to follow these regulations to a T, and to be also accommodating for as many um, patrons as possible and to meet sort of the, the standards that we're developing, these structures can cost easily north of, could cost easily north of twenty dollars to $30,000. So since the starting of the Design Corps with about 100 groups, we've really become a community of designers who've really shared, we're just a brain trust of 
different uh, of different designers and different restaurant owners coming together to share their experiences with one another. Some volunteers have really uh, come together to help inform to the city and to agencies and speak with city council about what we think the new rules and the, and what these new structures ought to, how they ought to perform um, in the future. In fact, one group developed an ABC winterization guideline working with the existing structures that were intended to be temporary. How do you take what was meant to be temporary into something that is significantly more resilient? Um, and others are continuously meeting with um, various city agencies, the DOT, the, the DCP, and with uh, the city council to talk through, um, you know, what the what the rules should be in the future. And so, it, as a community, um, we're working together on a really on a regular basis to talk about, you know, what comes what comes forward. Um, because as the design community, sort of in the representing the design community in the room. The reason why we're so focused on this is not only that this is an extremely important program for the hospitality industry, but recognizing that open restaurants, these outdoor streeteries are this brand new thing, as, as Robert said, that would have been such a foreign concept uh, before the pandemic. And now that the majority of the public are broadly accepting that, in, in lieu of cars, there could be other things on the street for um, urban spaces, that these outdoor streeteries are the next step in the future of what urban space really could look like. So it's really important that when we're talking about the future of outdoor dining, that we got to get it right, because now we're talking about getting this right to get the rest of urban urban spaces right in a, as New York City builds out for after the pandemic. So I have a small um, PowerPoint presentation just to showcase a few of these structures and what they kind of looked like beforehand and what we uh, kind of where they were in, in some non-compliant ways and, um, and to, to discuss kind of how we could be moving into the future. So I'll be really brief, but so yeah, this is the, this is our, um, our our page on our website. So if you just Google the NYC by Design Design Core, you'll be able to find our network here. And so people looking for assistance on their structures can definitely sign up to ask questions. This map was made in 2021, but we this is when we were serving about 65 restaurants. But we're kind of all over the place with the designers and with the restaurants that we've served. And as um, Emily alluded to, finding some sources, we've been very instrumental in, in providing a lot of resources to the Alfresco NYC Coalition, providing prototypes and design concepts to push the envelope on what we think um, outdoor dining should do to respond to issues that have been developed since the outdoor dining uh, um, program was developed. But as you know, Ro uh, Robert said in June, this is when the program started, and this was a visualization of the rules. These are the rules that were made in June 2020, and they are as simple as such that you can make these the the the, the outdoor dining structure can only go as far as eight feet from the curb lane. That they basically have to fit inside of a parking spot. That their dimensions must be as about as wide as um, as the storefront themselves. And that there ought to be barriers in place to prevent traffic from, um, you know, hitting pedestrians and prevent preventing pedestrians from going directly onto the street. And that they should be um, ADA compliant. People uh, uh, with accessibility issues should be should be able to access these structures. There's certainly a um, a social justice component to the design of the of of, of the original uh, regulations, trying to um, trying to meet. But as I was saying before, these rules change and changed a lot. So this was in June. This was in August of the same of the same year, August of 2020. So these barriers that could were porous now had to be closed. You needed to have tape reflectors. You were now allowed to put uh, a, a covering over your head as alluded with the umbrella. Um, 
But that didn't stop there. Things began to change again. So now there were further uh, um, revisions to, and changes to distance between um, bus stops and and really and and highlighting distance between um, other others uh, other utilities and aspects along the street. Placing plastic barriers now um, is 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 becoming the norm and the requirement. Um, applying snow sticks and applying uh, tape circuitously across the entire structure. These changes have been, these slow changes that you know they're that have, they haven't announced too well have been have been coming. And then this is as of today. This is this is how the emergency rules for the the rules for the emergency program stands. And now re really relaying back to how these structures need to be placed not along the not just in in conjunction with the business frontage but how they should be placed along the street with distance uh, along the curb and distance from the crosswalk now included so this is just a couple of uh some as we were doing research sort of explaining the the, the very beginnings of the outdoor dining program we were just really quickly seeing these ad hoc systems being developed across the city um, in some in pretty compliant ways and others not so much. Um, and then we saw basically by the end of the summer of 2020, the development of these tent structures once the umbrella graphic was developed. That's when the restaurants got the note, oh, I can cover our, our we can cover our heads. Let's put some umbrellas on there. Um, and this is basically a good visualization of how the bread and butter uh, outdoor structure started to become developed um you 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 if you you go to your your uh, hardware store and you get as much wood as you possibly can and you and you start building down your 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 bed structure um with, you need to keep it a little bit elevated in order for water to be, to properly flow um and you build that down then you uh build your your frame around it and then you can build a, a some sort of light um roof over your over the folks's heads to keep people um a little bit more comfortable and then you put your graphics on um then when that sort of norm was established some people some restaurants tried to go a little bit above beyond the norm a little bit. And, um, and we were seeing a lot of different varieties here that that's when the city started to really crack down on um, some, some structures going, let's say a little bit beyond the brief uh, that was laid out by the program. But in all of that though, we've seen just an incredible array of the different kinds of ways that restaurants can express themselves and their identity and express the identity of these neighborhoods and really enliven the street life in this in in along the city and this is just a smattering of some really great examples that we've found uh, um, in our research uh, in areas from Astoria to the East Village really showcasing what you know very excellent character and design can do to really make a place your place so, that being said, though, we do want to acknowledge that these structures were meant to be temporary. Um, and so them being on the street for for several years at this point has led to some issues that we you know that we do recognize. And that's where we're, we're I'm going to stop our presentation. But this is all to say that when we talk about the future of outdoor dining and these restaurants, what rules were placed beforehand were excellent in an emergency situation from an emergency framework and are, an, and are a great starting point in how these structures could perform in the future. However, there's going to be necessary discussions as we start talking about implementing a permanent program that really addresses a lot of the, you know, you know, clear issues around sanitation and and um, and health and security that was not really never really intended to address in the in in the outset of the program. But now that we've learned through hundreds and thousands, I think we have twelve thousands of twelve thousand of these designs now. We're really talking about a permanent program 
that can really address a lot of those issues while still keeping the amazing um, additions to the neighborhoods that these restaurants have now served. So, Joseph, thank you uh, very much for that presentation. Uh, there's a couple of questions uh, to be asked, but we will do that uh, at the end of our uh, all of our panelists speaking. And I thank you very much. Those graphics at the end were, you, know, you forget how vital and um, uh, lively some of these structures have turned out to be when you see them on a streetscape. So thank you very much. And I am uh, happy to uh, introduce our uh, third panelist for um, for surviving the uh, pandemic. And uh, Calvis uh, Mickelsteins, who is the, who will be on here shortly. We know that he's here. Um, here we go. And hi, Calvis. So he's an urban planner and public space manager. He is proud of having come from uh, Hamilton uh, City in uh, Canada. He's director of planning and operations at the Dumbo Improvement District, uh, where he manages all things public realm related. Uh, he, I guess Dumbo is the place where we can see what Robert was talking about, what Joseph was talking about, and we see these things coming together in a certain place, in a certain neighborhood, and we bring our focus back to uh, the Brooklyn waterfront. So, uh, Calvis. Thanks very much, Richard, uh, for having me today. And uh, hello, everyone. When I, uh, when I was asked to speak on this panel, I took some time to go back and talk to some of the restaurants in the neighborhood, uh, some of the restaurant owners and, um, and staff in uh, some of our local spots. Uh, to see, you know, how they felt, uh, you know, two years removed. Some people, it feels like a long time ago. For many, it felt like just yesterday. Um, so it was kind of, it was, it was interesting to look back and, and think about these, the, these ideas and, and talk to them about it. Um, and in a lot of ways, it felt like a bit of a fever dream to, to go back and think about these things. Um, in Dumbo, I'd say that um, everything started as it did in most places. There was a lot of uncertainty, uh, a lot of fear. A very tentative attitude from uh, from our restaurant owners, um, mainly because of the lack of clarity on so many fronts. Um, you know, first of all, uh, as we just saw, the rules were changing um, almost daily when it came to the structures that we were building outside. Um, you know, if you invest in building something one week and you find out three days later that some of the regulations have changed, um, you know, sometimes you don't have the budget for that, uh, or you go back to the hardware store and they're out of lumber. Um, it was a huge challenge from that perspective uh, to kind of keep up with what was required from DOT. Um, and then on the other side of that, you know, another regulation was the just the occupancy percentages that kept on shifting. Um, it really made it a huge challenge from a staffing perspective, from a, a resource perspective, um, trying to make sure that you were prepared for whatever was coming next. Um, and as I mentioned, not knowing what was going to happen and how things were going to change, we had seen so many quick, rapid changes uh, in the first couple of months that it was uh, really stressful to think about how they could further change uh, moving forward. Um, you know, otherwise, you know, uh, another element that was really uncertain was the regulations and the rules around things like PPP. So we did a lot of uh, support to our local businesses, not just restaurants, but across the board, trying to help them get through those, uh, you know, challenges and uh, make sure that they got what they needed. Um, on top of that, uh, the Dumbo waterfront itself or any waterfront neighborhood, I think yielded a couple of different uh, challenges as well for an outdoor dining experience. Um, you know, Dumbo being a historic district, we have a lot of narrow sidewalks, narrow streets in general, uh, which limited the ability for some uh, businesses to actually do an outdoor dining setup. Um, we've also got uh, the weather to contend with. It's a very windy neighborhood. So, um, you know, all the design requirements aside, you really had to think about how your structure was going to be built to deal with whether it was the wind, whether it was, you know, a smattering of rain coming in. Um, and then again, adapting to that element and trying to be flexible, um, you know, not knowing exactly how many people you're going to be able to seat inside or outside, depending on the weather, trying to make sure your staffing is lined up like that. There was a lot of, a lot of things coming together that were really challenging. <clears throat> um, but from the other side, uh, you know, being on the waterfront also afforded us uh, a little bit of an opportunity. 
Um, you know, Dumbo has a great waterfront park, uh, beautiful vistas and views, um, historic architecture, um, and it was a very definite destination that New Yorkers used when you couldn't be inside as a place to come um, and, you know, still be around people, still experience some semblance of normalcy uh, or whatever you want to call that. Um, it, you know, it also was an opportunity for some business owners to really uh, push the envelope and think about new ways to adapt. Um, you know, as Emily mentioned, the, the margins of profit for a restaurant um, tend to be really, really quite small. Um, and so it can be uh, a little scary to think about how you might want to change up your business model, because if it doesn't succeed, you could really run into some problems really quickly. But, um, you know, outdoor dining setups uh, gave you an opportunity to think differently about what kind of food you're going to serve, uh, to go cocktails as well. Um, adapting to uh, a takeout world was also interesting for a lot of our restaurants who maybe didn't offer delivery beforehand and now had to figure out a way to adjust to that world where they had to deliver, whether that was changing the menu to, um, you know, create a meal that traveled a little more efficiently um, or, uh, you know, changing it completely to think about different products. Um, you know, a couple, uh, one example I can think of is a couple of our restaurants actually started selling their uh, not full meals, but some of the products that come into their meals, whether those were eggs from upstate or hot sauce they make in-house, all these types of products were something that they started to try to, to sell. Um, in one example, we had a restaurant that actually opened up a little kind of shop inside once, uh, you know, 50% capacity was allowed so that people could actually come in and pick something up um, and take it home, which was, uh, you know, a creative adaption. Um, you know, from the open restaurant program, uh, it was a rough start for a lot of the restaurants as well. There were staffing shortages, as I mentioned, rule and regulation changes, um, trying to adapt to this to-go uh, world. Um, but then other opportunities arose from that, whether it was uh, a pizza shop figuring out how to sell their pizzas as frozen, um, new menu items, um, and, and things like that. Uh, lastly, before we get to the q and I think it's, uh, it'll be more interesting to talk about some of these questions we've seen, but I think that um, the last thing that really made the Open Streets program work um, was not necessarily having a, a designated spot outside your restaurant in our neighborhood. We, we experimented with a few different open streets uh, that we put tables and chairs out just as public seating and kind of tried to make it an opportunity to get your to-go meal and come and sit uh, in kind of a makeshift plaza. Um, and it kind of, it, it really reminds me of uh, something I heard recently um, from uh, Andy Wiley Schwartz. He, uh, uh, he had written in uh, Janet Sadiq Khan's uh, book a few years ago, why would so many choose uh, a plaza over a park uh, for the same reason that people at a dinner party gather in the kitchen instead of in the living or dining room. Um, and that kind of struck me uh, uh, as something really relevant in Dumbo because we do have such a, a big waterfront park right next to the, the district, um, yet we found these open streets to be incredibly popular and they continue to be so popular. So I think it really says something about, um, you know, the difference between a, a park and an urban plaza um, maybe isn't as soft around the edges from a landscaping perspective, but still offering, uh, you know, a really interesting experience, a really active, lively experience that, um, you know, was something people really craved for during the pandemic. And that was, you know, tangentially an opportunity to really support our local restaurants as well. Um, and uh, with that, I think uh, I want to thank you. And I think we should uh, get to the Q&A because I think there's a little bit more to, to flesh out from those questions. Hey, thank you, uh, Calvis. Appreciate that. that you know, the uh, and if Robert and... Um, and Joe can join us uh, and turn on their mics and their um, their video. Uh, it was an interesting observation about you know the parks are there because why? Well, city people always feel congested, and when everything's going in a certain way, you want to uh, get away for a little while, so you go to a park. However. During a pandemic, when that's all you are is away from other people, the idea of a public plaza makes a lot of sense, and it be, it it is uh, more attractive than uh, the. Uh... Hi, Karen. <laughs> Bye, Karen. See you later. Okay, so um, we do have one question uh, that uh, I I have several questions, but this one question 
is for um, is for Joe, and that is this. Benjamin uh, Kabak of Second Avenue Sagas posted a few days ago that he thinks the new outdoor dining rules being issued by DOT are meant to kill open streets through bureaucratic regu- regulation. Um, and DOT wants to kill the program through bureaucracy anyway, so we'll see where this lawsuit goes. In that city, really, do you agree with this assessment? And so um, I guess Joe and Robert, uh, if you uh, have responses to that. Yeah, I have to go first. So Mark, this is the perfect question to start with, actually. So thank you for for that, actually. Um, uh, No, I, I don't think that DOT is trying to destroy the program. I do think that they are responding to a lot of internal pressures. Um, and external ones dealing with these the temporarily designed structures. So they are working on ways to deal with making new regulations that will require more from these structures in, in how can they be packed in such a way, how can they be more responsive to hygiene issues and, and the like. But no, I do not think that this is an end that they are... Uh, bureaucratizing an end to to the program at all. I, I think that we're going to be seeing a, a a new renaissance of these structures once the law is passed. And that actually, that's the next, that's the first thing that we need to ask ourselves is what will the law look like and then how will the rules be able to be developed post passage of the law? So there's a few links in the chain that we need to be thinking about more, but I don't think DOT wants to kill the, this new program. I think, and, and particularly in talking about open streets, I we're seeing DOT also dealing with some issues related to open streets, changing some rules cha- and, and, and updating some things to curtail with some issues that were revealed when the whole thing was just opened up whole cloth. But no, there's not, there's not, a, I'm not seeing an impulse coming from them to regulate the thing out of existence and robert you've had I agree, I agree with joe as a matter of fact dot has been and i've been neck deep at this point in negotiations between three parties the industry the city council uh who's an equal party here because they have to pass the law and the administration dot has probably been one of the largest advocates for a continuation of this program it, it, not at all but when you say this program understand it's not just roadway dining. Uh, there, there were more restaurants that had sidewalk seating during the emergency program than had roadway seating. It was, the current anything goes was never intended to be permanent. Uh, but I can assure you that we are not going back to anywhere close to where we were before, where there were just 1,200 sidewalk cafes and no roadway dining, uh, mostly in Manhattan. So that's that's not going to happen, and there's nobody advocating for that to happen. Um, the, the strongest advocates for getting rid of roadway structures is, frankly, a few council members in, from some Manhattan districts uh, whose residents uh, have been going crazy about having outdoor structures, but they go crazy every time we have here for a liquor license application for a new restaurant or a bar in any event. So it's the same NIMBYs. Um, so no, I think the question... Uh, uh, the question is is not correct, and I think uh, everybody will be satisfied to a certain extent. Compromises, everybody's always somewhat unhappy, but I think we're going to see a robust, democratic, five-borough outdoor dining program, meaning lots and lots of all-year-round sidewalk cafes and some version, hopefully, I mean, definitely some version of roadway. I'm hoping, like Joseph, that we'll be able to also have some some nice design structures as well. Okay. Um, Calvis, you have, uh, uh, you want to jump into this or? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I tend to agree with what, uh, what Joseph and, uh, and, and Rob just said. I think uh, the appetite is there. I think most of the restaurants that um, in, in Dumbo that went for an outdoor dining program would want to continue. I think that they appreciate the expansion of their footprint. Uh, it's an opportunity to generate a little revenue and, uh, again, provide that, you know, more enjoyable dining experience uh, outside. 
I think there's something to be said about the seasonality of it, especially in a neighborhood like Dumbo, um, with uh, with the wind and, and and weather being what it is. But uh, I don't see the uh, appetite uh, decreasing. No, okay, I and, and Brooklyn is leading the way, by the way, uh, in 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 the halls of government and arguing for a a robust permanent program. And the last question, uh, and it's a more or less a follow up of this, is DOT the right agency to regulate this? And so, anyone who want to? Well, that that's a big, that was a big issue. The administration wanted DOT. Uh, the council wanted Consumer Affairs uh, to, you know, the old sidewalk cafe licensing. Um, uh, I think when it comes to roadways, clearly DOT is is the correct agency. You know, they, they control the roads. Um, there was a concept of whether it should be bifurcated, whether Consumer Affairs should keep the sidewalks and DOT the roadway. I think it's going to stay at DOT. Uh, we can answer that question better in two two years after the new law goes into effect, whether DOT was the right agent. Okay, we'll be back for that one. Thank you. <laughs> Joe, Calvis, you have, uh, either of you have an opinion on that one? Yeah, I'm, it's, it goes back to, you know, if you want a single agency to run the program, then you're it has to be DOT because you're touching the roadway here. And they're just a significantly bigger agency, the DCWP, that actually has architects and engineers on staff who know how to write rules related to this stuff so they uh, have the expertise to write to actually write the rules so yeah i think it, it's just kind of clear that there needs to be a robust investment into this into the enforcement of of this program within within dot but it, it's clear that dot is is the only agency that's qualified to do this that sounds okay about right. Calvis, and yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, I'd agree. I'd say the, a, a little thing to add, I guess, is to see DCWP, um, or rather, to see the movement um, from vending enforcement that recently uh, changed from DCWP over to DSNY at the beginning of this month. Um, I think shows that DCWP is probably not the agency that should be uh, getting involved in this necessarily. And as um, as Joseph said, you know, one large agency that can handle all of it seems like. Uh, the uh, safer move, maybe. My only, my only concern. That's why I'm saying we'll see what happens in the future. These uh, uh, Department of Transportation doesn't have any history of being a licensing agency, and it's different regulating roadways from licensing businesses. Uh, even during the pandemic, with the emergency rules, restaurants would get a 24-hour notice. You're in violation. You know, we're taking away your right. And I would write them a letter saying, "Says who? You know, whatever happened to the concept of due process?" Who says we're violating the rules? How about an administrative hearing? How about a judge making a determination? How about an opportunity to cure? These were these were alien concepts to them because it's their roadway. So they're going to have to morph into a licensing agency that comes with a you know with legal rights and responsibilities. Okay, and I think we will leave it there. Uh, Calvis and Robert and Joseph, thank you very much for doing this. Really enlightening, really educating. And it's going to give us a, a new perspective on what we're going to see. And we'll all come back in two years and see how that has worked out. So <laughs> thank, you, thank you. Thank you very much. Joseph and Calvis, they're great. great. They're the future. These young people who are helping this <laughs> industry, they really are the future. Thanks, Rob. Great. Thank yes, in, in their hands. Yes. So thank you very much. Um, and now I... So now we will see, we've talked about how uh, restaurants, what measures were taken to have restaurants survive. We've seen some specific uh, examples of this. And uh, through the policies, federal policies, city policies, and now we are going to be uh, hearing our second keynote speaker, uh, Sinjin Frizzell, who is a, an owner of... Uh, a co-owner of the uh, restaurant Gage and Talna. He's an award-winning writer, bartender, as well as being a restaurateur. Um, and he's also the founder of Sunken Harbor Club at the same uh, location in Brooklyn and in Bermuda. Uh, and he's the owner of Fort Defiance. Those of you who pass through or live in Red Hook know about that critically acclaimed uh, cafe, bar, and general store. 
And so it is my pleasure to uh, introduce and uh, turn the uh, screen over to uh, Sinjin. Okay, unmute yourself, there I'm you mute. go. I'll, I'll learn one of these days. Um, Thank you, Richard. Thanks for having me. It's that was a great panel. It's really nice to be in a room, a virtual room full of allies of the restaurant industry in New York. It's just really warms my heart uh, to hear all this um, positive uh, conversation. So um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to walk you through sort of the history of uh, Gage and Tolner, the restaurant, which uh, was originally founded in 1879, and um, and talk about how the pandemic. Uh, affected um, the business and the opening of the business. And by the pandemic, I mean the recent one, not the one that uh, Gage and Tolner survived in uh, the early 20th century. So uh, let's see, I'm gonna share my screen in one moment here, guys. Um, getting there, here we are. All right. Okay, um, so uh, this is a presentation. This is adapted from a presentation that I usually give to staff that's incoming, just to explain sort of the history of the restaurant and what we're doing here. Um, you know, this all started back in 2017 when my partner Ben Schneider and I were looking around in downtown Brooklyn for a space to open a small cocktail bar, something about a thousand square feet that we could run with maybe 10 employees. Um, and uh, that didn't, that we didn't get that. What we got was something a lot bigger. Uh, there he is with um, his wife, my partner, Chef Sohee Kim, their two kids who are in high school now. Um, that was taken quite some time ago. They uh, Ben and Sohee opened the Good Fork uh, back in, um, early 2000s, and uh, that's a little neighborhood restaurant in Red Hook, Brooklyn, where we all live. Um, I opened Fort Defiance right down the street from them in 2009 after um, a career in publishing. Um, I was a copy editor at uh, Bon Appetit magazine. Um, ben and Sally opened Insa a little bit later after that. That's a Korean barbecue place and a karaoke joint in Gowanus. These are all really fine businesses, by the way. If you haven't been, uh, you should go to all of them. Um, but what we're talking about today is this place. This is, believe it or not, Gage and Tolner. Um, this is probably circa 2015 or so. Um, as you can see, it is the ugliest restaurant in New York uh, or ex, ex restaurant at this point. There's an Arby's sign on the facade there. Um, there uh, is clearly something going on inside that's not food sales. Um, and this is kind of how I was introduced to the restaurant. Um, I used to wait for the 61 bus a block away from here and, uh, and just look and marvel at what had uh, become of what was really one of the country's uh, finest restaurants. Um, let's see. There we go. This, that's another look at the interior. Uh, we're going to talk about the interior in a second. The, um, the interior of uh, Gage and Tolner was the, the third interior landmark uh, designated in New York City after um, the New York Public Library and Grant's tomb. You can see here, not a lot of respect paid to that interior, but you can also see the, the brass chandelier sort of hanging down there as a um, as a remnant of what once was, uh, they were not removed because they were uh, protected by landmarks. Here's another look, um, and that's what it became. So this is uh, this is me and my partners. This um, photo appeared in New York Magazine uh, in February twenty seventh, twenty twenty. Um, and uh, you can see here, uh, this is the first line of the story that they ran. By the time uh, Gage and Tolner closed in 2004, after a 125 year run, it had had eight different owners. When it reopens on March 15th, it will have 378. They're referring to the crowdfunding that we did on, I'll, I'll get to that later, 
but they're, you know, you can see they're kind of burying the lead here. Uh, the, our, our original opening date, there was no way to know how faithful it would be in February, but it was March 15th, 2020. So a process that we started in 2017 was supposed to culminate in this glorious moment uh, when uh, Gage and Tolner would finally reopen on March 15th, 2020. Needless to say, that did not go as planned. Uh, there it is. <laughs> um, so when we walked into the space in 2017, it looked like this. So all of the all of the false walls that were hiding these mirrors were gone, um, and the track lighting was gone. The signs were gone from the facade, and the landlords were really interested in marketing this space as a restaurant again. I mean, they were open to anything, but they would they really wanted it to be a restaurant. They uh, shopped it to. Stephen Starr and Danny Meyer and you name it, um, Andrew Tarlow from uh, the uh, diner group. Um, but no one really saw the potential there. Uh, so um, we set about sort of trying to raise the money to, to get this restaurant back open. We figured it would take about uh, $2 million, which is a bigger budget than we had for our small uh, cocktail bar. So the next uh, few years became all about raising money for us. And getting to know the story of the place. Now, neither me nor my partners had ever been engaged in Tolner when it was open, although we lived in Brooklyn at the time. We just weren't savvy enough to, to you know, to walk through the doors. But um, the, the journey to, you know, discover the history of the restaurant began here at the Brooklyn Historical Society. And specifically in this room, this is an, another interior landmark. This is the reading room. At that, um, at the historical society, and there we found um, boxes of ephemera that had been donated by the family that used to run the restaurant and own it, the Dewey family, who we'll meet in a moment. Um, the society had just received uh, thirteen boxes of ephemera, so this was old menus, um, newspaper clippings, photographs, like you name it. And from that uh, collection, we were able to kind of piece together uh, the history of the restaurant and write it really for the first time. Um, there, there, there is no uh, Gage and Tolner book, unfortunately. Uh, we're working on that, but um, you would think a, a restaurant that had been open for 125 years and widely recognized as one of the best in the country would, would have um, a book associated with it, but that wasn't the case. So the 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 story of uh, Gage and Tolner really begins before it opens. Um, talking about the history of uh, Brooklyn as a borough, this is a old map from the fifties of uh, the borough with um, the Native American trails sort of laid over the current streets. We're going to, of course, focus on the the downtown area um, here. And if I had this on a screen, I'd be pointing to things. But um, you can see that line that goes sort of from the upper left to the lower right. That is um, that is what was uh, Fulton Street. So now sections of it are called Old uh, Fulton Street, especially down by Fulton Landing, where the ferry used to bring you across to Manhattan. And even when uh, Gage and Tolner opened, the Brooklyn Bridge had not opened yet. So that was the only way to get to uh, Brooklyn from uh, Manhattan. But if you took the ferry over and followed Fulton Street up the hill, it would run south on what is now uh, Cabin Plaza West and then get to um, uh, where uh, Gage and Tolner is, which is right here. And as you can see, um, this is the current corner of Fulton Street and a little one block street called Red Hook Lane, which uh, used to run um, all the way to Red Hook, obviously. Uh, it actually runs right past both of our houses in that neighborhood, my uh, partners and I. Um, so uh, this place was a busy intersection long before um, Europeans even you know, got here to Brooklyn. Um, and it's a crossroads. And uh, I'd like to talk about it with our staff as a place where um, where people will meet if they're going in opposite uh, directions and they may never meet again. 
Uh, but it is a place and has always been a place, if you believe in this sort of thing, with a lot of sort of meeting energy. Um, and we think that uh, it still is. Um, fast forward uh, to uh, the 19th century. Uh, there's a guy named Charles Gage. And his father is an oyster salesman on the streets of Brooklyn. He had an oyster stand on uh, Navy Street up by the Navy Yard. And uh, his stands probably looked something like this. This is an old Harper's Weekly from the, from the same time period. Oysters were, you know, huge at the time. And, and uh, they were easy to get. You could have them roasted as the guy on the right is doing, or you could have them raw as the guy on the left is doing. Uh, there he is, Charles Gage. He decides to go brick and mortar with his with his oyster operation and opens it on Fulton Street, uh, on a section of Fulton Street that would now be uh, Cabin Plaza West. Um, in uh, early on, I think a year after he opened in 1879, he took a partner uh, named Eugene Toller, who was a cigar salesman. Um, and uh, here's a little account of their meeting. Uh, it's very cute. <laughs> uh, Tolner is there uh, drinking a, a cup of coffee and um, Gage asks him, how would you like to join me in business here? Tolner says, I would very much. When could I start? Gage says, right now. And Tolner says, where do I hang, our, where do I hang my coat? And thus began a historical partnership. Um, the Times reported that they worked together for more than 40 years um, and never had a dispute. Uh, as a matter of fact, Mr. Tolner named his son uh, Gage. So for a while in the early 20th century, there was a guy named Gage Tolner walking around the streets of Brooklyn. This is a look at um, Bolton Street in 1895. You can see the elevated uh, train tracks that run right, right um, down the middle of Fulton. On the left there, you can see the old Abraham and Strauss building, which is now um, a beautifully restored Macy's. And then uh, Gage and Toner is going to be right down there with the, where the where the red arrow is. Um, I highlighted this sign over here on the right uh, because it advertises a oyster and chop house for gentlemen and ladies, um, and uh, just sort of to show that the oyster and chop house, which is what Gajan Tolner was and is, was a pretty popular uh, business model at the time and would have been uh, recognizable. There were probably uh, dozens in the neighborhood. This is the oldest piece of ephemera that we have from uh, the collection or that we uh, were able to photograph. This is a, a to-go oyster box from the early uh, 20th century. Um, you can see the names down there at the bottom of uh, Cunningham and Ingalls. Those are the the owners that um, that bought the place from uh, Gage and Tolner in 1911. Uh, and just to go back, we don't have any uh, pictures of uh, Cunningham and Ingalls. It was an interesting story. Um, Mr. Ingalls was the partner who actually knew something about restaurants. Unfortunately, he died in the dining room of uh, Gage and Tolner just a few weeks after they purchased it. Uh, and the founders, uh, Gage and Tolner, came back to give uh, Cunningham a hand. So they didn't retire for long. They were pressed uh, back into service. And Tolner ended up working there for, for years and years longer. Um, and they said, there was one uh, newspaper account that said e even before Ingalls um, died, uh, the, their retirement didn't really take. They were, quote, like two lost sheep after they sold out. They used to drop in and sit there for hours. It was just hard for them to stop working. Uh, in 1919, the um, Cunningham uh, sold the building and the business to Brad Dewey uh, of the Dewey family in New York. Uh, they were a big wine uh, family. You can see on the right there, postcards from their other uh, business, uh, which was a wine cellar slash restaurant in Manhattan. And, you know, you might recognize that 1919 was also the beginning of uh, Prohibition. So uh, 
the Dewey family tried all sorts of things to kind of, you know, diversify their business, including, you know, creating these kind of snake oil patent medicines like uh, do for all, which would be port wine mixed with olive oil and iron as a um, vitamin supplement, you know. Um, here we are in the 1920s, prohibition still raging. Um, you can see Tolner is the small man that's, or the smaller man that's right there in the center of the frame. Uh, Brad is to uh, Tolner's right. Um, from this era now, we have tons and tons of material, including, um, you know, menus that we got from the Brooklyn Historical Society and menus that we pulled out of crates from a, a kind of a hidden attic space in the Gage and Tolner building. Um, I thought you might want to have a look at these. Uh, it's just fascinating to see what was on the menu in those days. And they ran these menus, by the way. There was a version of this menu that they ran from uh, at least 1911, maybe further back, until uh, the 1980s, um, with a, a supplemental menu that we'll see later. But but it's amazing how little changed on this menu. You can see there's uh, something like two dozen presentations for Saddle Rock oysters there. Um, Saddle Rock was a, a, a you know, a place you could get oysters in Long Island that uh, no longer exists, but they were extremely popular. Get them uh, raw stewed, milk stewed, cream stewed, fried, Chicago fried, Baltimore fried, etc. cetera, crumb fried. Uh, we cut down on the prison. We still sell oysters, not quite as many preparations though. And by the way, for you food historians out there, what separates say a cream broil from a Baltimore broil might be, you know, something as simple as parsley, or breadcrumbs, or something like that. Um, so Seth uh, Bradford Dewey um, passed away in uh, uh, 1938, and there were great uh, tributes to him written in all of the local papers, including the Herald uh, Tribune, which said, he deserves to, re to be remembered by all hearty and discriminating eaters. He was not impressed by modern furniture, tea room frippery, strange dietary fads, machine-aged gadgets, or pretty hostesses, in quote. Uh, Gage and Tolner is still carrying on for the pleasure of men and women who occasionally feel the unashamed pangs of an honest hunger or thirst. May they remain staunch in the faith. This um, is to, to show you that even um, when, at the time when Brad passed away in 1938. Gage and Tolner was a throwback restaurant. Um, it had been open for almost 50 years at that point and was famous for not changing much. So to, to step into uh, Gage and Tolner in 1938 was almost as much of a step back in time for the people who lived then as it is now. Um, now we reach, I'm going to go back a sec. Here, here we meet Ed Dewey. Ed is, um, uh, uh, the, he would um, control the restaurant for the longest period of time, uh, 50 years almost. Um, and uh, he took over when he was in his 20s. And here he is in 1954. This is around the 75th anniversary with his sister, uh, Trinette, and his brother, Tom, who were both involved in the operation of the restaurant at that point. Um, they're dressed up like uh, Gage and Tolner here, and Trinette is dressed as uh, Lillian Russell, um, a famous actress who used to frequent the restaurant, often in the company of Diamond Jim Brady. Uh, the 50s were kind of a heyday for uh, Gage and Tolner. Um, they had a lot of uh, publicity around their uh, 75th anniversary, including down there in the lower left-hand corner, they're, they're winning awards from Holiday Magazine, which was kind of the Bon Appetit magazine of its day. Um, and here are some of the waiters from the restaurant in their um, really quite elegant uniforms. The gentleman on the left there is named Leon Gaskill. Uh, 
and in 1954, um, Gaskell was uh, congratulated on working there for 50 years. The photo on the left, you can see that the gentlemen are displaying their left sleeves there. That's where the Gage and Tolner servers wore insignia to, to signify um, how long they had worked there. You got a, um, a bar for each year, a star for every five years, and an eagle for um, 25 years. And there were people who worked there who wore two eagles on their sleeve, including Leon uh, Gaskill, who is... Um, on the right here being uh, congratulated for his 50th work anniversary. Incredible. Uh, here's some shots of the party taken inside the Gage and Tolner dining room. Um, it's fun to do this presentation when, I'm, when we're actually in the dining room because the space I do it is sort of right behind where the gentlemen are there on the lower right. Nice party. Um, then, uh, we get into sort of the later era, the, the 70s. There's a gentleman named Ed Dewey who's brought on as a manager. Um, Ed's wife, Trudy, becomes uh, a bigger part of the restaurant and um, helps to manage it. Uh, there's a, um, in the 70s, also Ed Dewey and Trudy um, shepherded Gage and Tolner through the landmarking process. Again, that, that kind of really saved the restaurant. Uh, there's, you know, if you look at what's happening in uh, downtown Brooklyn now, it's really hard to imagine that uh, Gage and Tolner would exist if it wasn't legally uh, protected. And in 1975, at the um, the landmark hearing, uh, the borough historian, a, a gentleman named uh, Joseph Polisi, testified that uh, Gage and Tolner had exquisite food, excellent service, and a sense of timelessness through which something of a carefully preserved past is made to contribute to the fullest enjoyment of the present. Um, and by March of 75, both the interior and the exterior had uh, received landmark designation. Uh, you may be noticing that there's a lot of uh, pictures of men up to this point. Here is the first woman to work at the restaurant, Ann Dedman. Um, she was a cook in the kitchen, uh, and she's fabulous. Uh, she's um, still cooking or maybe has just retired. She was a, she became a professional uh, caterer with her own uh, business. She's a delight. She's been in uh, the restaurant. Um, yeah, it's just wonderful. That's in 79. Yeah. This is a view of the upstairs dining rooms. Now, um, if you're familiar with the building, it's a four-story brownstone on Fulton Street. And the the Dewey family lived on the upper three floors until the 70s when they converted the living area on the second floor into private dining rooms, which you see here. Original chandeliers, ceilings, and fireplaces still exist. Uh, they put a bar in. Um, in the 70s, it's just this beautiful brass and glass um, Victorian 70s uh, vibe. It's just beautiful. Um, here we are in the 1980s. There's Ed and Trudy and John Simmons, again in the dining room of uh, Gage and Tolner. Uh, and then um, now uh, Ed and Trudy have run the restaurant for about 50 years. It's time to retire. And they uh, passed the restaurant on to a gentleman named uh, Peter Ashkenazi, who um, uh, lives in Brooklyn Heights currently. Uh, Peter was a sort of a power broker and restaurateur in New York in the uh, 70s and 80s. Um, he helped uh, create the Fountain Cafe in Central Park under Mayor John Lindsay. Uh, and had always been drawn to restaurants of historic importance, like um, he was a part owner of Gallagher's and the Rainbow Room. And uh, one of my favorite historical restaurants in New York, although I never went, Luchow's, which was a German place that was founded in 1882 and existed into the late uh, 20th century. Peter um, tapped Edna Lewis to be the new chef at uh, Gage and Toner, which was a pretty bold move. He met uh, Ms. Lewis in Virginia when she was uh, catering a wedding there. 
Um, um, Edna had previously cooked professionally at a place called Cafe Nicholson in the 19, late 1940s um, on the east side of Manhattan. This was a restaurant which, you know, researching this one is very rewarding if, if you're interested, but it was a it was a cute little restaurant with a courtyard that was frequented by uh, the literati of the day, like William Faulkner and Tennessee Williams, Truman Capote, Gloria Vanderbilt, Marlena Dietrich, that kind of thing. Um, and then uh, Ms. Lewis kind of drops off the culinary map for a while. She releases a, a cookbook called the Edna Lewis uh, Cookbook in 1972. But it was really um, the book that she wrote in 1976, The Taste of uh, Country Cooking, that really um, kind of launched her onto the main stage. Um, Taste of uh, Country Cooking was about um, the food that she learned how to cook growing up in Freetown, Virginia, um, in a farming uh, community there. Um, very seasonal, very farm to table, very simple. It was a different view of Southern food than New Yorkers had experienced uh, before. It definitely wasn't soul food. It was more of what we would call farm, farm to table now. And this was really one of the first uh, cookbooks that talked about food in that way. Um, Edda's uh, contributions to American uh, cookery can hardly be overstated. So um, there's lots of uh, good articles um, about her history out there. If you're not uh, familiar, um, definitely uh, look into that. Um, here she is again. Here is one of Edna Lewis's menus that would have been given to guests alongside that old one that I showed you. Um, again, you can see just how simple these presentations are. Uh, the desserts sound really good, the pecan pie chocolate souffle. Um, she introduces she crab soup to the menu, which becomes very well known and we still have on the menu now. Uh, I would say that the things that from the old menus that people ask after the most, and we knew that we had to include on the current menu are the she crab soup for sure. Number one, number two, the hash browns, which uh, may surprise you. It certainly surprised us, but um, people had very fond memories of the hash browns and cream that they served at uh, Cajun Tolner for many, many years, and uh, they are currently on the menu, and they're excellent if you if you go. Definitely um, don't miss them. Um, things don't go great for for um, Mr. Ashkenazi on Fulton Street. Uh, he closes the the restaurant in '94, and um, it's acquired by Joe uh, Carico in 1995. Joe can be seen here uh, looking dashing in a double-breasted blazer in the 1970s. Um, he uh, is a Sicilian immigrant who kind of works his way up through the restaurant business. He still has a place called Marco Polo in Carroll Gardens, uh, kind of a grand Italian restaurant. And um, it was... Uh, this was a good period for for um, for Cajun Tolner for a little bit. Um, uh, there was um, he modernized the kitchen, he improved the infrastructure, uh, he gave the interior a facelift, um, all with the enthusiastic cooperation of the New York Landmarks uh, Conservancy. Um, it cost about half a million dollars. Ruth Reichel. Uh, the famous food and restaurant critic visited in 1996 um, and spoke to the gentleman on the right in that photograph. His name is Wade uh, Sinclair. He had been a captain at Gage and Tolner for over 25 years and said it was busier than he ever remembered it being. Uh, and um, he was really happy about that. Here he is again. There's Wade. And um, Wade, I'm going to go back to that picture. We got to meet Wade uh, Sinclair um, before he passed away last year. And actually, at some pre-opening events that we had at uh, Gage and Tolner that we did for investors, um, Mr. Sinclair joined us and sang along with a pianist um, just some 
songs from the American Songbook. Um, he has had a beautiful baritone voice and was a really, uh, really sweet guy. So it was it was a real, it was a real honor to get to know him before he passed away. Uh, then you know after uh, Joe closes the restaurant in two thousand four, which you know it was uh, two thousand four is kind of an interesting turning point I think for the Brooklyn restaurant business. Um, this is a time when restaurants like Andrew Tarlow's Diner and Marlowe and Sons were Marlowe and Sons I think came a little bit later, but Diner was really starting to hit its stride, uh, and it seemed like people were were really interested in a in a new type of restaurant, a young um, mom and pop style improvised ad hoc restaurant uh, that served kind of fresh and trendy food. Cajun Tolner was none of those things at this point and um, was in a neighborhood that that people, you know, stopped recognizing as a uh, destination, especially for uh, for dining. Um, so in 2004, it was taken over by TGI Fridays, for better or for worse. We don't have any photographs of that era, but it closed in after three years and reopened as an Arby's, which we do have some photographs of. This is the Gajan Tolner as an Arby's. Um, not much to say about that, except, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then after the Arby's closed, less than a year later, uh, it reopened as a jewelry store and then um, became, you know, changed hands quite a bit until um, at the at the end, it was um, sort of a flea market with uh, a lot of different things happening inside, a lot of different vendors kind of crammed into the same room. Apparently, there was a fortune teller set up back by the, the women's restroom and the upstairs uh, dining rooms, which we saw earlier, were divided into a hair salon, a nail salon, a tattoo parlor, and a place to get grills, like uh, dental uh, jewelry for your teeth. Um, and uh, yeah, but when we came in, all of that stuff was cleared out. And uh, uh, and we, you know, had a vision of, of restoring the restaurant to its former glory, now knowing that the history of it and what all that means. Um, we had a difficult time attracting attention, attracting money to this project. We tried to raise uh, the two million the old-fashioned way by just asking the wealthiest people that we could meet for it, but uh, had little success with that. Um, a lot of people just didn't believe that people would go back to Gage and Tolner. Um, and didn't have the faith in the evolution of downtown Brooklyn that we had. Uh, um, we looked up and saw cranes and knew that there were going to be, you know, just thousands more people living in the neighborhood than there ever had been before. Um, we also really liked the denseness of the transportation around that area, which is the second densest uh, transportation hub outside of Times Square. Nearly every subway passes underneath the floors of that restaurant. So we crowdfunded it. We we used a platform called WeFunder, and we attracted uh, more than 350 individual lenders. This was uh, not um, the sale of equity, but um, we were asking for for um, loans that we would then repay with a share of revenue, uh, and uh, um, it worked. Uh, we attracted, like I said, uh, 350 plus. Small investors who were investing a thousand dollars a piece or more, um, the the enthusiasm of that crowd attracted the attention of the of the equity investors that we needed to raise the rest of the budget. Um, and here we are again. This is February twenty twenty, um, all set to open. As you can see, we uh, had our waiters in uniforms. We had oysters in the fridge. We had cocktails on ice. Everything was ready to go. And then on March 14th, the morning of March 14th, we decided uh, not to open to the public the following day. And um, and yeah, and that, that began our pandemic year. I was hopeful. I wrote this message to our um, to our mailing list and said that Gage and Tolner has already survived two world wars, the Great Depression, 
the Spanish flu epidemic and prohibition, it will survive this as well. And I'm happy to report, as you probably know, that it did. Um, and I will just talk about a couple of things. I don't know if you can, oh, whoops. Oh, here we go. Okay, great. Okay, so this is um, something I threw together just to talk about sort of what relief um, uh, we were able to get and what relief we were not able to get. And I, I include our other restaurants here for context. Um, so the, the most, the biggest factor of success in a restaurant during the pandemic was whether or not your landlord was sympathetic. And um, we have, you know, three out of four there were. Uh, Fort Defiance actually had to close and relocate um, during the pandemic, uh, but the rest are fine. Second, the restaurant revitalization fund, as I heard the panel say earlier, very well-meaning, but not very effective. Um, the uh, I think the gentleman said that 25% of the restaurants that applied in New York um, received this uh, funding and the rest did not. So it actually hurt the restaurants that the, that the, did not receive the funding more than it helps because it was an enormous block grant to um, to the restaurants that got it that then could use it to improve equipment, to pay hiring bonuses, to recruit the staff that they needed. Um, it just created a, a huge imbalance in uh, the restaurant industry that really kind of threw everyone off for, for a year or more. Um, we're still trying to recover from that. Uh, the ERTC, I don't know if anyone uh, mentioned that was a great program. Open restaurants, hit or miss as to how that was able to affect uh, the restaurants in question. And drinks uh, to go, also like a little hit or miss. I think Fort Defiance was more successful than that with that program than anyone else was. Um, that is the end, unless uh, we have, I'm sure we have some questions and stuff. Richard, do you want to? take over here uh thank you so much for that sinjin um we're a little bit tight on time but uh there is at least one question and i sort of remember this from i actually uh uh did go to gauge in talna early on and i have to be honest i knew that i couldn't remember if it was the um uh peter luga waiters that had the stripes or gage and talna so now you cleared that up for me uh yeah. and i i do remember the stripes the stars and and the like and being impressed with that uh someone asks what uh that she noticed that many of uh the waiters in the early pictures with the stripes were uh african-american and was uh uh just explain that was that so and uh was that accidental intentional or what yeah so we've done a lot of research about this and reached out to historians that kind of specialize in racial politics of the early uh, 20th century it's a little bit of a puzzle not just some of the waiters but all of the waiters were black until the 1970s and what did this mean what did this mean in 1880 what did it mean in 1900 what did it mean in 1965 i mean it's kind of a moving target and um it's a little bit hard for us to kind of wrap our arms around i think the main question for us was was this a good job um and the the answer to that i think is yes um judging from the 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 longevity of uh of you know how long people worked at the restaurant and the fact that these jobs tended to be passed down in the same family so a father to a son or uncle to a nephew um that happened frequently um so it was a it was a job where you could where you were working indoors at the time in the 1880s when when um when there weren't a lot of jobs for black men that were indoor jobs a lot of sort of uh construction jobs um road work uh delivery that sort of thing and um so it was a it was a job where where you um and it wasn't like working at a dock you knew you could get to work every day you knew that you could make money and uh and there was a certain amount of respect that you commanded from uh, your community um waiters had their regulars who who would always sit in their sections they were well known in their uh communities and 
you know, other than that, that's where our, our research kind of stopped, um, but would love to carry on this conversation with someone that knows more about this than I do. Okay, well, thank you very much. Your, um, your love for what you are doing just comes right through in your presentation. It was a wonderful presentation. It put a lot of things together for that. Uh, those of us who work in downtown Brooklyn have seen for you know, our working lives. And so uh, thank you uh, very much. And uh, we appreciate the presentation. And we'll be talking to you soon. Okay. Thank you, Richard. A great pleasure. Thank you. And now um, for, we are just a little bit late. We had scheduled a break, but I think maybe uh, those who need a coffee break or a bathroom break can just take it some time as we are uh, trying to keep on schedule. And we have our next panel uh, that is um, coming up. And this panel will be moderated by uh, Kana Zaff, who is a, a photographer from the Rocky Mountain region of the United States. Uh, he works in journalism as well as performing arts and currently lives in Mount Vernon. His work can be found at uh, CW Zaff, but that will be on in the chat, his, uh, his, uh, the connection to that, the link to his work. And so I am happy to turn this over to Hana, who will um, introduce this, the panelists. And now we are going to hear uh, the story of the uh, deliverers and some that we've been hearing earlier in earlier presentations, and now we will uh, hear this. And as I mentioned earlier when I was opening, uh, the work that they do is tremendously important, and you see the seriousness of it when uh, we see the murder that was in the news. The murder was in from the, I think, 1921, and the... Um, and and the uh, sentencing was um, was just yesterday. And um, I now turn it over to uh, Tana. All right. Thank you so much, Richard. Appreciate that. Um, thanks everybody for joining. I appreciate that. Uh, as Richard said, I'm Connor Zaff. I'm a journalist here in New York, and uh, I'm really excited for today's panel. We have some incredible speakers, some incredible panelists, um, who I'll introduce now, including Lahia Gualpa who is the co-founder and executive director of the Workers' Justice Project and Los Deliberistas Unidos. Uh, for more than 12 years, she's been organizing in New York City uh, among day laborers, construction workers, domestic workers, and of course, most recently, and pertinent to our discussion, uh, app-based delivery workers. Uh, under her leadership, the WJP launched Los Deliberistas Unidos, the country's largest workers' collective that represents 65,000 app delivery workers and is organizing to advance the rights of app-based delivery workers here in New York City. So we're very excited. Along with that, we also have William Medina, who is a member leader of the Workers' Justice Project and a leader of Los Deliberistas Unidos, uh, a collective, again, fighting for workers' uh, rights and labor standards in the app-based delivery industry. And rounding out our panel today, we have Jamie Woodcock, who is a researcher based in London and a senior lecturer at the University of Essex. He's the author of many books, including Troublemaking, Employment, The Fight Against Platform Capitalism, The Gig Economy, Marx at the Arcade, and Working the Phones. His research is available online, and he is inspired by workers' inquiry, primarily focusing on labor work, the gig economy, platforms, resistance, organizing, and video games. So I'm very excited today. Um, as we've stated earlier, uh, please, if you have any questions during the uh, during the interview here, please put them in the Q&A section. Uh, we sort of envision this section as more of a, a free-flowing conversation. Um, but to get things started here, I'd like to start uh, with Jamie to sort of set up a, a sort of wide shot of what we mean when we use the term the gig economy. Uh, Jamie, your work often focuses on this thing, uh, the gig economy. So I was wondering if you could sort of uh, Give us a sort of summary or an overview of what that term means for anybody who might not be familiar with this conversation already. Yeah, thank you so much, and it's a it's a real pleasure uh, to come and speak remotely uh, to you from London. I, I do hope the weather is better in 
on the Brooklyn waterfront than it is in, in London right now. Um, I'm going to start by saying something which might not make a whole lot of sense, given I, I wrote a book with the title The Gig Economy, um, which is that the gig economy, I think, isn't always the most helpful way to understand the kind of things that we're going to be talking about on, on this panel, because in a way, you know, work has always been precarious. Um, you know, the term gig economy goes back to to the idea of, of work being a gig. Um, so jazz musicians playing a gig, you know, being paid on a on a one off. Um, and I'm sure there's a very long history of these kind of shorter kinds of work on, on the Brooklyn waterfront, you know, uh, dock work and other forms of work that have, you know, long been been precarious. Um, and where I am in London, you know, used to be docks that have, have a very long he- history of this, too. But I think a lot of this has returned today when we talk about platform work. Um, which is a kind of uh, new way of organizing the demand for and the supply of work through digital platforms. Uh, and I'm sure the other speakers can can talk much more in much more detail about what that's been like in uh, in, in New York City. Um, but it's a, a phenomenon that's grown incredibly quickly over the last 10 years or so, and then even more during the pandemic and afterwards, as people change their consumption habits to have food delivered um, more regularly, whether that's hot food from from restaurants or from uh, from other places or grocery delivery. And I think it's really become a focus for lots of people to understand how work is changing more widely. Um, So it's a way into many of those debates, I think. Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much for that. Um, So to get, you know, to go from a, a sort of wide understanding to a, a, a more specific one, uh, William, I wanted to move over to you and ask uh, if you could sort of describe, A, what sort of working in this field is like, working in this trade, if you will, and um, and especially during the pandemic and how things have sort of changed uh, for delivery workers over the last two to three years, sort of what the most pressing issues have been during the pandemic um, and now sort of coming out of it uh, and what that what that experience has been like for you. Is William with us? William, you there? Hello? Hi, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Hello, okay. everyone. Perfect. Uh, did you hear my question or do you need me to restate it? Uh, uh, can you repeat it? Uh, yeah, no, no. yeah okay. it's not a problem. Uh, I just wanted to, so as, as somebody who works in delivery work um, and is familiar with the, you know, the field, I'm curious about if you can describe for everybody who is who's you know probably not familiar with working the job, um, sort of what it's been like during the pandemic uh, and how things have changed for uh, you, pe- your colleagues, people who work as well in delivery over the last two to three years, and sort of uh, what the most pressing issues have been. Uh, yeah, hello everyone. Uh, I just want to share it briefly. Um, my name is William Medina. I'm a member for Worker Justice Project and uh, leader from Los Deliveristas Unidos. Um, I just want to share briefly my my experience during COVID-19. And and uh, I, I wanna share, I wanna share some, uh, a photo and video. Uh, just give me one second. Uh, uh, can, uh, can, can I share a photo in the group or no? Um, I don't know if you are set up as a co-host. Uh, Richard, is William set up as a co-host? Um, we can do that. Uh, Jasmine or, uh, or Jim, can you? He should be able to share. Okay, you should be able to share, William. Okay. Bottom of the screen should be share screen, and you should be able to do that. Oh, okay, no. Okay, so. <clears throat> Are you so, on you? No, I'm not, I'm not able to share the, the no. photo. Are you on the okay. phone instead of? Yeah, yeah, I'm on the phone. I'm not in my, in, with my computer. I'm on the phone. All right, so it might be a different. Okay. Okay, so, no, no, it, it's not a problem, okay? Okay, fine. Okay, so um, I, I experiment uh, very difficult times during the pandemic. 
Um, I had to work as a delivery driver with my electric bike in Manhattan every day. And I was living in Queens and I had to ride my bike every day for an hour, one hour back and forth. Um, I was listening how people uh, clapped me in Manhattan from uh, the buildings. I literally understand uh, that you never give up. At the beginning, uh, I was experimenting so many feelings, frustration, stress, depression, scared to get sick. But at that time, I thought that you are exactly in this city for a specific purpose. That mentally pushed me to keep continue working for the people that was dying and were experiencing very difficult times as me. Um, that time, I take the decision to start helping people and I cannot imagine how many people have very complicated moments in life. When I knew about Worker Justice Project in the last year, I become a member and a few months later, I become a leader for a very huge mo movement where I apply all my experience and knowledge in the streets as a delivery worker. Since that day, I'm working hard to help my coworkers in so many ways. I'm really grateful and proud to belong in a community that I feel really need me as a leader, as a person, as a friend. Now we are taking the leadership with my partner, Antonio Martinez, helping delivery workers around New York City. And I think that the people are very grateful with us. Thank you. Hey, uh so moving from that, uh, Lihi, I was wondering if I could ask you about how uh, you came to uh, help found Los Libertistas Unidos and how the WJP sort of got involved with this initially, what sort of inspired that um, and, and how it's been going so far. Lihi, are you there? Yeah. Can you repeat the question? Sorry, got disconnected. Oh. That's all right. Um, I, I'm curious about uh, how your work with the uh, the Workers Justice Project sort of began uh, with delivery workers, uh, what the sort of beginning of Los Deliveristas Unidos was like, um, what drew you to that to that struggle in particular, and, and, and sort of what the early days were like. Yeah, so, um, so thank you for, well, thank you for inviting me. Well, actually, I just wanted to kind of mention Today is Workers' Memorial Day as well. So today we actually, we're, 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 we're in Foley Square because today we're gonna be honoring um, the deliveristas who actually died um, doing this job. Um, these are like the unsung heroes who um, many clapped as essential workers, but these are also workers who happen to give their lives. and. Uh, an important moment, moment in New York's history where um, it allowed, I would say, every New Yorker to stay safe and fed at home. So Workers' Justice Project um, actually is, is an organization that w existed since, um, since 2010. And part of our, our mission has been organizing and empowering workers to um, win better protections. And that was the exact same um, case, not only during the pandemic, but in, in times of disaster, in terms of emergency. Um, it happens to be low wage workers, particularly brown and black workers who have become, who become the first responders in times of disaster. Um, and that was the exact case within the pandemic. It was black and brown people who became the COVID-19 first responders in one of the most essential workforce for, for, um, for the hospitality industry was delivery workers were the ones who uh, were keeping um, business open for many restaurants, transporting the food in essential time that New Yorkers really needed. Um, but while uh, this was happening, um, very, th there was, there was few issues that I think were not acknowledged that um, when delivery workers were working, were no longer working for the restaurants, were working directly for the apps. Um, and th th that there was a new reality formed. Um, and that meant that um, app delivery companies um, that 
were like DoorDash, Uber Eats, Grubhub, uh, were making billions by charging exorbitant fees to the restaurants and delivery fees to consumers um, to to offer um, a digital platform to connect them with services. Um, they were literally paying nothing to deliveristas. Um, so app delivery workers were left to rely mostly on tips as their main source of income. But they were also experiencing other issues um, like traffic crimes, um, robberies. Uh, most deliveristas were actually, aside from the fact that they didn't have any form of pay, had to um, experience also tip theft. Their own tips were being stolen by, by the apps. And many other issues where they had to travel long distances putting their own livelihoods and their own safety at risk. And it was during the pandemic uh, in a time where no one was speaking about the value and the essential labor of deliveristas that uh, delivery workers like William that came to our organization um, that said, you know, enough is enough. Like they, there, there needs to be something about making sure um, they're not left um, unprotected. And that's when in 2020, um, you know, um, workers, leaders like William rise up to form Los Deliveristas Unidos um, with the support of workers' justice um, to be able to secure new labor protections. Um, and some of them um, are actually labor um, laws that didn't exist and doesn't exist for app delivery workers, um, such as the right to have a bathroom, um, which is, it's, it's, it's a human right. Um, the right to be able to see the receipts, to be able to see how much their tips are. The right to have a pay. Um, very few consumers and New Yorkers know that deliveristas actually don't have an actual form of pay. Um, and we're also, deliveristas are now building a new um, last mile micromobility infrastructure like Los Deliverista Hubs. Um, because one of the things that we have realized is that, um, one, one of the, you know, deliveristas have been not only experiencing issues, um, labor issues or labor um, exploitations by the apps, but they're also experiencing challenges navigating a poor infrastructure in our city. Our city was not, this, is not designed for 65,000 deliveristas who are riding our streets um, on safely. Uh, and one of the one of the things that we're looking to address is how we make sure we build a new safer micro mobility infrastructure where there is charging stations, there is parking stations. We share the public space to make sure that these streets, who happens to be the workplace of deliveristas, are also safe for hardworking New Yorkers who continue to be and will continue to be essential workers for the city of New York. And uh, to follow up on that, uh, Lahia. Um, I'm curious about sort of what the uh, environment was like when you first began uh, organizing with deliveristas and, you know, because this sort of market, because this workforce is so diffuse, right, it's not just one central working place, uh, you know, where everyone is, you know, has the same boss, has the same kitchen that they go to, uh, you know, it's, it's all over the city and not everybody is sort of on the same page. I'm curious about uh, what it was like initially to sort of... Uh, start getting people who were maybe on the fence or weren't aware of the Workers' Justice Project or aware of sort of these needs, what it was like to get them involved and what sort of, uh, what the enthusiasm level was like. Yeah, well, one of the, the realities we, we, we came aware is that um, app delivery workers was a workforce that um, was, was invisibilized uh, mm -hmm. in many ways. It was a community that, um, had not been reached out, engaged, nor by city government, nor by um, social justice agencies, um, was, was abandoned um, in a critical moment of time. And some things that we came across is a lot of, most deliveristas um, were not aware of the social services. Many deliveristas did not know um, how to file a police report if they were a victim of a crime. Or sometimes when they did it, they felt like ignored or um, the liberistas experienced that um, when they got sick, they didn't know um, if, where to get 
um, um, affordable and accessible health care. Um, when they got sick, many stay at home. Um, when there was a basic necessity to access essential social services, um, most of them were excluded. Um, the, the reason Work to Justice Project became so connected is because in a critical time where most, like pretty much the entire city shut down and we stay open as a worker center, offering and connecting um, workers with essential um, services. And, and it was at a time where we noticed that it was a community that was ignore it was abandoned that we started connecting um, with many of them with through WhatsApp, with um, with even WhatsApp groups that they had they had to create as their own way of survival and protecting each other. And what we have observed is that the liberistas felt not only abandoned, felt isolated. So many of them find strength on each other in 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 building this um, WhatsApp groups networks as a way to build mutual support. Um, and this was a way also how the Liberisa started organizing and sharing many of the issues that they were experiencing um, in the industry. Uh, many were experiencing through these WhatsApp groups and sharing the same experiences of experiencing bike robberies, of experiencing traffic crimes, or experiencing that um, their tips have been stolen, or the fact that the restaurant didn't want to open their facility because of safety issues. Um, the fact that um, they there was there was it, you know they were traveling long distances for a delivery of two dollars, um, and that was I think a moment using this this WhatsApp groups, this networks, and this space to build unity um, and build a momentum that it is important to come together um, and to really come out and rise up to show the power that they have in our city, and and they did it. They did it. As Los Deliveristas Unidos, not only by passing groundbreaking legislation, but by showing to the city that they deserve not only protections like a minimum pay, but they deserve um, the right to have also a safe infrastructure that uh, addresses their basic needs. Um, and, and I think that's powerful. And I, you know, it, and as William said, they're still committed to transform not only um, the the gig economy, but to transform um, the my you know build a new micro mobility infrastructure for in New York City. Mm -hmm. And I and I'm, I'm very curious to get into sort of the the political side of this with you as well. Um, but before we before we get in that direction, I, I want to come back to Jamie really quick. Um, sort of now that we've heard some of these uh, these shared issues and these shared hardships. Uh, that a lot of delivery says here have experienced. I'm curious from an international perspective, uh, what of that sort of rings true uh, across borders? You know, what are the sort of key similarities here and also the key differences uh, between delivery workers, both in the US and in Europe and, you know, even abroad from there, you know, in Asia and places like that? Yeah, I think this is a really good question. Uh, I, I've been doing research with food delivery workers in London since 2015. Um, so I've seen a kind of longer, Kind of spread of uh, of these experiences, and I've spent some time doing field work in in India and in South Africa, um, and also in Hong Kong. And I think, you know, many of the issues are really really similar. Um, and I think to to hear from both of our previous speakers talking about uh, the burden that many of these workers took on during the pandemic, um, and you know, it's very been very similar in London too that the rates of of COVID were much, much higher amongst delivery riders and delivery workers. Um, the, the rates of road traffic accidents, the way that workers are treated compared to, to people who are employed has been very, very different. I think one of the first things to say is, of course, healthcare is handled differently in the US. Mm. Um, you know, people have access to healthcare in, uh, in, 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 in Britain in a different way, but many of the platforms didn't take seriously um, the kind of uh, health and safety concerns uh, of people who were who were working through the pandemic. I think one of the interesting things about these platforms, you know, whether it's Uber Eats or or, or in Europe, uh, platforms like Delivery are much much more common. Is it started to create very similar experiences of what it's like to work uh, as a food delivery driver, um, to work through an app, to experience these problems that that, that, that both have talked about in terms of you know, not knowing if you're being paid correctly or, or tipped correctly, 
the lack of communication from platforms. You know, these are becoming very, very common experiences for workers, you know, across the world in, in lots of ways. But I think what's been quite inspiring, um, and it's really great to hear about the organizing that's been happening in, in New York City, is everywhere these food platforms operate, they generate resistance from uh, from workers who are who are working for these platforms. So in London, we had the first ever strike of, uh, of food delivery platform workers at a company called Deliveroo. Um, they had a five day strike um, around around pay and conditions. And what we've seen year after year uh, is workers taking strike action, uh, forming worker networks, some forming unions. I mean, many. Uh, delivery drivers are unionized in in Britain. Um, across Europe, there are, are, are unions of delivery drivers. Is seeing within a very short space of time, workers responding to these new conditions and experimenting with ways to improve their terms and conditions. Now, if we look historically at many new other industries, it sometimes takes a generation for workers to to find out what what forms of organization work or, or what tactics work. You know, car factories, it took a generation of workers struggle to, to change those conditions. In only, you know, less than a decade, um, you know, there's been huge creativity from, from workers responding, uh, responding to these things. Um, and so I think, you know, I'm sure many of the delivery drivers in, in New York have, have been in contact with, with drivers in, in other parts of the world. But there's a lot of sharing of tactics and experiences. So, you know, particularly migrant work has been a really big focus, um, you know, for, for platforms of recruiting uh, migrant workers. And so, for example, the neighborhood I live in is, is majority Brazilian workers and Bengali workers. Um, and when there are strikes in Brazil, Brazilian riders in London, you know, send photos in, in solidarity, you know, share how things are going uh, and talk to each other and, and share these experiences. So in a strange way, these platforms have almost laid the basis for new worker movements and new forms of solidarity. So they're not just changing how we buy food and how we access these things. They're also bringing workers into contact with each other who are experimenting with really exciting new ways of organizing. Right. And I, and I sort of wonder if that's uh, partially a byproduct of this line of work being uh sort of touched and touching uh, all sorts of different aspects of society, right? This is not just a, you know, a single workplace issue, right? This is uh, an issue with technology. This is an issue with infrastructure. This is an issue with, you know, traditional labor rights, all kinds of things. Um, and so to follow up on that a little bit, uh, and, and I'll start with you, Jamie, but really this is a question for both, for, for all three of you. Um, are those efforts uh, to organize uh, delivery workers and, uh, start implementing different working tactics and things like that to uh, to you know better the working conditions and, and receive more adequate compensation. Are are those methods of uh, of resistance being shared across borders and are they becoming more formalized or more discreet? Do we have are we starting to see organizations working with other organizations in a more formal way, or is it still uh, somewhat informal, somewhat loose? You know, sharing on social media things like that. So that's a, a really great question. And what I would say is particularly in the European experience, there is quite well documented evidence that, that, that this is happening. Um, so in 2017, there was a strike in London and it was then followed by strikes across France, Italy, Germany, which were a direct response. You know, people messaged each other. They, they shared these experiences. Um, and Callum Kant, who's written a, a fantastic book on, on Deliveroo, it's called Riding for Deliveroo, which is in, I know you don't have this platform in New York, but it's like Uber Eats and, you know, they're all pretty much the same. Um, mapped and documented these waves of, of struggles that went across Europe in which people learned from each other um, and then formed a network, a uh, career solidarity network that brought together unions and worker networks across these different uh, different organizations. And I think, you know, this is something that doesn't happen in other kinds of low paid work. Um, you know, there are cleaners in all of these cities, right? There are security guards in all of these cities. But working for apps and platforms has given people a, a, a kind of point of contact with each other to share these things. And one of the reasons why I think this is important is, you know, I once heard a senior manager at Deliveroo talk about what they thought was important with this kind of work. 
And he said, it's not just about changing delivery work, but it's about changing our attitude to work and to social security more widely. Um, and in Britain, this is about changing our payments for health insurance, for pensions and so on, is it's about trying to say that old employment doesn't work anymore and that instead we should all be working through these short-term arrangements. Mm. And I think this really matters for hospitality. Um, and there's probably, you know, beginnings of this happening on the Brooklyn waterfront as well, is now pubs in London, they employ some people directly, and then they're trying to bring people in on apps to do other bits of work. And so really it's an experiment that of course it matters for delivery drivers, but if this experiment is successful and workers lose out, it will start to be used more widely, you know, in other kinds of industries. And it's a very old story. You know, it's about driving down terms and conditions, right? Right, right. Uh, Lihi, I'm, I'm curious about if you have anything to add to that, uh, specifically since, you know, Workers' Justice Project and Los Deliveries Los Unidos does so much work in Brooklyn. Is there, uh, is there some work being done to uh, also share, you know, whether it's tactics or strategy or interests, um, with with workers outside of the U.S., especially given as you as you highlighted earlier that you know most of this workforce are are immigrant workers, many of them come from the global south. Uh, is there sort of a political effort being made there? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think um, unfortunately, I think in the U.S. we we're we're behind when it comes to um, you know organizing um, gig workers, uh, particularly because our I would say labor um, our labor laws are outdated um, and it doesn't fit the new new economy and there is a new reality in, in, in our country which is gig work which mm -hmm. has pretty much taken every sector not like from delivery cleaning like th there is a, everything it's it's changing in our in our economy and I think we're we're behind in trying to figure out how not only we offer labor protections to a new workforce, but how we organize, engage, and make sure that we are building a strong worker forms of um, organizing. Um, we, we are experimenting. I think in, in the US, there has been experiences in California um, and others in Seattle where workers are rising up. Um, I think we are all experimenting in the US and actually learning from what ha what's happening in the other countries too. Um, and the big challenge, I think it's, there's a couple challenges. One is, I think the, the, as I said, the labor laws are, are really outdated, which gives little to no protections to any of workers. And also it kind of puts in a very difficult way even to organize legally workers, even as a union, because they're considering independent contractors, which means they're not covered on the, the NLRB. So unionizing, we're like a long, uh, there's a long pathway to get there. We are in New York. I think what is unique is that we, we've been testing new things. We're like the first city in the country that passed six labor rights protections for the libertistas. One of them happens to be establish a minimum pay right. uh, for the first time in history for gig workers, which we won. But unfortunately, our um, the city hasn't delivered yet. We're like four months past due uh, because of the incredible lobbying power and pressure by the apps who's using not only their lobbying power and fueling money to make sure that they don't have to pay a living wage but they're using their power to even divide workers around the narrative um that if if we now have to pay you a minimum wage you will lose your flexibility you will lose the ability to work on the app and we're seeing how these companies are becoming more and more innovative and creative about how to make sure that they maintain not only control of the narrative, but also make sure that they dismantle any organizing effort. Um, in New York, we, we're, we're actually facing a big battle um, that is not well taught. The fact that this New York City has to establish a minimum pay um, and a right that was already secure through two years of organizing. Uh, and until now, we're still fighting the power of big corporations for trying to undermine not only the organizing effort of Los Deliveristas Unidos, but also are trying to water down a proposal that will guarantee for the first time in history, an actual dignified pay. Um, and we're testing. I think you said going back to organizing models, what's there. 
I think we're all testing what it really means to build organizing power, um, secure worker representation, um, secure lab new labor protections, and to build a pathway for unionization, which is what uh, William and Los Deliberistas are dreaming for, to being able to unionize, to be able to negotiate that contract, um, that um, they feel it, 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 it would give them more rights and more protections when it comes to designing how they want to do, how they can do this work safely um, and, and transform it into a profession that they, they, they feel proud and it's dignified. Right, right. And, and on that note, uh, I'm, I'm curious, William, if you, uh, if you could enlighten us to sort of what the attitudes of uh, delivery workers has been uh, since hearing that, the, you know, this counter proposal from the, uh, from the Department of Consumer and Worker Protections that has sort of reduced, you know, promised a certain level of pay and then reduced it. Um, I'm wondering what the, what the reaction has been uh, I'm imagining it's negative. I can't imagine uh, people are feeling particularly good about it. Um, but I'm curious from what it, uh, what the feeling is like on the ground, uh, seeing that kind of resistance from the from the city government. Oh, did we lose? Did we lose William? That's all. That could also be a question for you, Leah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he's traveling to the Workers' Memorial Day event. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, that's happening. <laughs> Um, but um, que tenemos una actividad ahorita, un evento, y por eso a veces nos toca cerrar el centro. So William está preguntando cuál es el sentimiento de los trabajadores con esto que el pago fue reducido, uh, especialmente eh, en un momento eh, de ahora. ¿Qué, qué, cuál, qué es lo que, ¿Cuál es el sentimiento del trabajador? Con lo que ahora, bueno, bueno, ahorita yo como trabajador experimentamos pues, muchos sentimientos, más que nada la frustración. Eh, la frustración es una de ellas. Eh, también, pues, eh, la esperanza que tienen los trabajadores por esperar un, un salario que, pues, que todavía no llega y, y no se sabe tampoco cuánto es. Entonces, pues, eh, tenemos muchos, muchos sentimientos, ya que son más de dos años de lucha en, lo, en la que nosotros, pues, estamos eh, dando todas nuestras esperanzas hacia, hacia la ciudad que, que nos puedan dar un un pago digno para nuestros trabajadores. Yeah, there is a lot of frustration. Um, um, there is a lot of hopelessness. Um, sorry, there is a lot of hope. Willy, lo puedes poner en mute? Sorry. There he is. There he is. Um, yes. <laughs> so there is a lot of, I think, frustration, um, hopelessness as well, because uh, after two years of, of the struggle, um, is still in, in fight, we're still not seeing a minimum pay being delivered. Um, and, you know, there's all, many of us that are still hopeful that the city would deliver something that we deserve um, as deliveristas. Yeah, and, and, and Lydia, I'm, I'm curious about uh, what the Workers' Justice Project and what Los Deliberistas Unidos is sort of thinking uh, in terms of changing tactics politically now that we're seeing this sort of resistance and and uh, this this sort of apathy from the city government, uh, what what's the what's the plan? What's the strategy change to deal with this politically? Well, well, there's two things. One of them is definitely shifting the narrative. I think you know the companies have consciously built this narrative about flexibility um, and that this work is. Is, is, it's more part-time um, and one of the biggest challenges we still um, are fighting for is that these companies are using even the algorithm to communicate that message and to divide workers. Um, so one of the things that we are building is in, in, a narrative that allows workers to understand the industry and what actually is happening. Um, the other one is um, building also alliances um, with consumers. So mm -hmm. our hope we're going to be launching a new consumer justice campaign to because we strongly believe that there is a lot of power um, and force if workers can find strength and unity from consumers in the restaurant industry who are also being victims of what's happening in the industry um, and. And, and there is a lot of power in unity and conversations to do 
to make sure that you know we fight um, the injustices that uh, workers and even restaurants are experiencing um, when they charge exorbitant fees just to connect to to deliver their their food, right? Um, while workers are getting paid pretty much nothing. Right. That's really that's uh, very interesting. I, I wish we had more time. I'd love to follow up on that. Um, but to, to again, go to, to take this a little bit wider, uh, Jamie, I'd like to move to you. What we're talking about here, uh, sort of the common thread that we're talking about here is that this is not just a, a sort of fight with the tech companies. It is it is one dimension is that. But we're also starting to see that uh, that that uh, that governments in various localities are also starting to become involved and having to regulate these things. And, and in your book, you talk about. Uh, how state regulation is a big factor in sort of characterizing the gig economy and, and gig work. I'm curious if if this sort of uh, situation in New York City where uh, the lobbying efforts of these big tech companies uh, being impressed upon the city government is common uh, throughout most of your work and if you've seen sort of similar things and 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 ways that you've seen that dealt with, you know? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the big focuses of these companies initially has been to lobby quite extensively. Um, and so particularly around employment status. Um, and this, you know, has been challenged in, in, in many jurisdictions of whether or not this constitutes something that is, <clears throat> is, is, is self-employment or not. I think it, it, in a lot of cases now, governments are becoming involved in, in one way or another. Um, to give you an example from from what's happening in in London, there you know a, a lot of these platforms haven't provided the infrastructure for drivers, um, and are unprepared to invest in infrastructure uh, for drivers, and so both local government gets drawn into what's happening here, but also restaurants too. Um, one of the big issues that that drivers face in London is access to. Uh, to bathrooms or places to rest or or charge their phones, these sorts of these sorts of things. And so, you know, we have somewhere in the region of forty thousand drivers in London. I think I heard sixty thousand in in New York City uh, earlier on. Is you know, cities now have to catch up with where how these changes have have affected uh, you know people's experience on the roads and and so on. But I think one of the risks in this is that platforms are let let off the hook. Uh, you know, these platforms are making lots of money. They've had lots of investment into them. But if they want to take advantage of big workforces who can who can deliver these things, we should be saying it's not just the responsibility of governments, but also of platforms to to meet some of these uh, these these new requirements and so on. And part of this is about how our cities are changing. Mm. Um, you know, I'm sure it's the case on the Brooklyn waterfront that parking isn't that available. Um, you know, in London, it's very difficult for people to find places to park. And so we need to think about how our cities change in response to, to changes in, in work, too, rather than expecting drivers just to, to carry the burden of this. Right. 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 And, and again, this is, you know, there's so many facets to this particular fight, you know, uh, between infrastructure and immigration and technology. It's it, uh, it is so dense and so complicated, but we are coming up on time here. Um, so I wanted to ask a, a sort of general question for all three of you, which is sort of because this is a conference about hospitality and about the hospitality industry, I'm uh, I'm trying very much to avoid the question of what can the normal person do to help with this because that seems a little trite. But for people specifically in the hospitality industry, um, what are some things you'd like to see? Uh, you know, either from restaurateurs or restaurant workers. Uh, uh, you know in terms of how they can sort of lend advocacy to, this, to, to these problems and sort of be uh, in solidarity with delivery workers? I will start. Um, uh, so I think there's a lot that can be done um, and is not being talked about. I think in the hospitality industry, I feel like there is a lot of cross alliances that can be done. I know that um, like the hospitality right now is trying to maintain the fee cap while deliveristas are trying to um, you know, secure a minimum pay. Um, and I feel like there's a lot of mutual collaboration in advocacy and lobbying. Um, and even like redesigning our city infrastructure to sh share public spaces in a dignified way. Um, so those are some of the things that I think can happen in the industry. And then for a regular person, you know, from the consumer um, to, the, uh, to the worker who's behind the counter, um, 
I think there's a lot that can be done. I think for consumers, you know, tip transparency is huge problem. Um, we, we've been encouraging consumers disclose the tip, right? Disclose how much you're leaving um, to empower workers to be able to fight um, wage theft. Um, the other one is good, making sure you always give a good rating, right? There is so many problems that happens um, through the delivery work that sometimes all the blame is blame onto the worker. Um, and, you know, the rating is use it as a, as a way to retaliate um, against workers, which is a huge problem. And then for those that are working in the hospitality industry is like communication, right? Like there needs to be the fact that the labor force has been so fractured. Um, there is a lack of communication that I think um, puts delivery workers in a, in a big vulnerability, um, which is like making sure that, you know, um, the restaurant can be honest and transparent when food is delivered. Sometimes, you know, in the restaurant industry, when a restaurant says um, the food is ready, but the delivery worker arrives and the food is not ready and has to wait, um, the the app puts all the blame and actually gives a bad rating because it's 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 pretty much blaming the worker for having the food and holding the food in the restaurant for longer periods of time. Um, and the for the apps, time is the time is it's precious, and and workers are receiving exa like exorbitant amount of pressure to deliver faster, quicker, um, and, and, and are, are purely controlled by the algorithm, which impacts their ability to stay in the workplace. Right, right. William, any thoughts from you about uh, how restaurant workers and restaurateurs and, and consumers can be sort of in, in better solidarity with people who do your kind of work with delivery workers? Uh, yeah, uh, I just I just want to say that, uh, like Ligia um, mentioned, that uh, it, it, we just we just need transparency with the with the tips, and we just uh, uh, we just want to to the treatment uh, for the workers. It, well, uh, it's uh, it will be um, respectful. Great, and Jamie, last words. Yeah, I mean, I I, I won't say too much because I think that's. Uh, a really good place to end on. But I think for many of us, it's about asking questions about, you know, what conditions people are working under, whose, whose work we rely on. I think that's a really important starting point. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you three so much. This has been really, uh, hopefully educational. I know, I know I really enjoyed this conversation. So I hope everybody else did as well. Uh, thank you so much for being here. So, uh, and let me uh, thank everyone. I have one small question. Hannah talked about uh, what's the normal person to do. Is it better for uh, delivery drivers to uh, receive a tip in cash rather than to put it and include it on the uh, app credit card when you're when you're doing that? Uh, William is or Leah is. Yeah, um, I, I cannot. I think. Uh, definitely because of the lack of transparency, cons like deliveries appreciate so much that tips are done in cash. So, you know, we highly encourage that, but we also encourage to disclose the tip to the worker. Um, um, when, you know, the Absolutely. worker is de delivering your food, like let them know, you know, I gave you a $10 tip, make sure that that's, that's in, that, 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 that is given to you. Um, and that also empowers workers to like ask the, the app, you know? Um, so, and the other one is always give good ratings. Um, even your food gets cold, don't blame on the worker. Um, and, and, and because a lot of these ratings is what the apps use to give them work and more hours um, and to stay on the platform. Okay, so I, I can't uh, express my appreciation enough. This was, this added so much to today's discussion. And we understand that you know, the hospitality that we all experience and receive is uh, due in large part to the work that uh, William and your colleagues uh, do. So um, thank you so much for appearing. Jamie, thank you for coming all the way across the Atlantic for us uh, and continue with your work. And uh, Lahia is uh, now, uh, I'm sure, going back to uh, her day at Foley Square with the uh, Workers Memorial Day. And uh, thank you all. And Connor, you did a great job as moderator. Thank so thank you uh, very much. Thank you.
Thank you for inviting thank us. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much. And now for our uh, last uh, panel of the day, um, we are uh, going to be looking at the future. We've heard uh, how people made it through the pandemic. We see uh, the, the plight of workers, how one enormous change uh, from the pandemic was uh, through the uh, delivery of, of, of food and uh, Yes, they have. Deliverers had not been recognized enough. And as uh, he had mentioned at the beginning, when that clapping was going on, they were essential workers. They kept people uh, fed at the risk of their own health and uh, lives and at that of their families as well. Uh, and now I'd like to uh, uh, ask uh, Karen Goodlad, who's going to be our uh, moderator for this last panel and i know she's here Hi. um good afternoon i hear a sound yes now a vi video and um i would it's like to uh here she comes so karen is uh, a a good colleague of mine she's an associate professor at uh, city tech she is the head of the hospitality uh, department at City Tech. Uh, she was named as a total food service, a top woman faculty advisor. Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> a top woman in Metro New York food service and hospitality in two nine, two, 2019 and 2020. She's a certified specialist of wine with the Society of Wine Educators. Um, and she is a proud and active member of the La Dame Escoffier uh, of New York, which is the premier international organization of women leaders in food, beverage, and hospitality. Uh, her academic publications highlight her work as an educator and cover topics such as place-based learning, the first year transition to college and wine education. Karen. Thank you. That's me. Hello. Thank you so much for inviting me and these fine guests to speak today. I have been uh, engaged since this morning, and I think that uh, this to the topics that have been discussed are vital and that we must continue to speak with them. Um, for the person who's controlling the cameras, uh, the way that we're going to run the panel is that um, I'd like to have everybody's camera on just because we're going to be a little uh, interactive and, and they'll be able to talk back and forth with each other. So uh, whoever's controlling that, please uh, put them on for all of the panelists. Okay, so everybody should be able to unmute themselves. And I think we might have to do mm -hmm. the uh, the video. Yes. Uh, Robin is here. Good morning. And I know I Andrew just arrived. Andrew's here. I yep. know he's here. And I did see Jesse before. I know that she came from her class. Here she is. Hello, okay. everybody. So you guys are all set. Okay, wonderful. Um, uh, the way that we're going to go is we're going to be a little interactive. So I have a couple of questions for everybody. They'll be able to um, say a little bit about uh, what brings them here today. And then we have a fortune telling session um, at the end. Um, but first, what I'm hoping to do is uh, just to share a little bit Oh, it's not sharing the way I want it. Um, share a couple of headlines and why it's important um, that we are talking about what we are today. Um, so we have here uh, information about, and is it not sharing the right way? It is not sharing the right way. So I'm just going to stop sharing and just read a little bit. Um, so some of the topics that we're going to talk about today are ghost kitchens, and uh, Eder has recently uh, talked about uh, the anti-ghost kitchen, which is uh, Andrew Corrigan's, and then uh, also other information about um, ghost kitchens is uh, DoorDash has just opened a ghost kitchen uh, food hall in downtown Brooklyn, uh, so uh, that's curious interpretation of a food hall. 
We have uh, discussions about the workplace and the worker. A couple of headlines that I had highlighted were uh, em employees allege rampant workplace harassment from Boston Restaurant Tour icon Barbara Lynch. Uh, Me too still, right? Uh, we've been there and still doing that, unfortunately. Um, how to make can of butter. Um, and that's both in Bon Appetit and in um, uh, Wine and Food or Food and Wine Magazine. Uh, best cannabis infusers, talking about scales for this. Uh, let's see. Uh, DoorDash, Grubhub, and Uber Eats are always, um, aren't always what they seem, how to spot a ghost kitchen, and so on and so forth. So uh, we have headlines in both um, uh food related magazines and then also on CBS and in the regular news. So uh, I think this is hitting everybody all along. So I'd like to introduce the panelists briefly and then I'll give them an opportunity to um, share more about themselves. Uh, we'll start with Andrew. And Andrew is um, just getting to us. There we go. Um, Andrew is the co-owner and head of operations at Hungry House. Uh, Andrew has recently completed an MBA at NYU Stern School of Business, specializing in sustainable business and global sourcing. Uh, prior to his career in operations, Corrigan worked as a chef at many of New York's finest restaurants, culminating in a stretch as the executive chef at Cook Shop in Chelsea. Uh, Andrew was born and raised in Minnesota and holds a degree in classics from Bard College. So a uh, little bit of everything there. I love that. Um, uh, next, I will introduce Jessie Riley. Um, Jessie, I do have the good fortune of knowing personally. Um, she is the founding partner of Food Startup Help and responsible for the original business concept. Uh, Jessie graduated from NYU with a master's degree, where she also taught graduate level course courses in the arts program. After deciding to pursue a lifelong interest in food through more formal training, Jesse graduated with highest honors from the professional program at the Institute of Culinary Education. Some of you might know that better as ICE. Uh, she then worked in New York City restaurants, a bakery in France, and wholesale production bakery in New York City. Um, uh, Jesse has taught professional cooking classes at Kingsborough Community College, where she also worked on curriculum as well as cost controls. And then I have the good fortune of working with her at New York City College of Technology in the Hospitality Management Program, uh, where she teaches a lot of our culinary courses and also has recently developed a course, Cooking with Cannabis, um, where she discusses responsible cooking strategies. Um, she's now teaching the first section of that course for the college. Next, I'd like to introduce Robin. Uh, Robin C. is a, on a mission to improve the workplace culture of the hospitality industry. Robin graduated with distinction at Yale University and is currently pursuing her MBA at Stanford University. She leads strategy at Ka uh, Casamata, sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly, Enrique Olvera's Hospitality Group, which includes Pujo in Mexico City and Cosime in New York. Previously, C. Um, Robin uh, worked on the business side of restaurants in New York and London and across kitchens and dining rooms in Copenhagen and Hong Kong. With experience in management consulting and food tech startups, she brings her business lens to restaurants and not only improve the operations, but also the culture, helping lift up the industry as a whole. Uh, after the various speakers that have uh, come before us today, I think uh, we know how important all of these three topics are, and I look forward to uh, engaging a little deeper in them. So um, I'm just going to go by the way that I see people on the screen here um, and give everybody just a, a little bit of time to uh, introduce themselves, go a little deeper into who they are beyond what a short bio can offer. So Robin, uh, you're first. Love to hear more about what brings you here today. Happy to start, Karen. Thank you for the very generous introduction. Um, so as you've already mentioned, 
my background is very much on the business side of restaurants. Um, I feel like I've lived quite a number of lives across consulting and food startups, but also restaurants in the kitchens and the dining rooms. And so I think like many people in this audience mm -hmm. listening today, I have had the great fortune of working in some incredible workplaces with managers that I thought the world of. I came in excited, engaged, eager to contribute every single day. Um, but I've also worked in some pretty toxic places where I felt miserable and tired and apathetic, just counting down the days until I could find my next role. And so it's really no secret, especially to the folks here, that hospitality is quite a notorious place um, for being a hard industry. And I think many people actually pride themselves on surviving in that place. Um, but for me, what's really personal is that if you look at the history of hospitality, it is built on this principle of the act of feeding strangers, which is one of the kindest things that humans can offer each other. And it's crazy to me that these workers, these restaurant workers who devote their time and their energy to such a beautiful act also have some of the worst abuse in the workplace. And so, like you alluded to, I'm very much on a mission to try and change that. Um, and so, you know, hopefully through some of the questions that we'll cover today, what I'd like to touch upon is briefly, you know, the history of restaurant workers. How did we get here? I think if you look way, way back centuries ago, um, kitchen labor has traditionally been more of a blue collar industry, not a ton of social status. It's not something that people used to be very proud of. Um, and if you look at how that's developed over time with the traditional French kitchens, you have the brigade system, which is quite literally based on the military hierarchy. Um, and so that's where a lot of that culture comes in. Um, and within the US, we have still the relics of these very oppressed systems like the tipping policies, which came from the era of slavery. And it's really meant to keep the servers and the working class oppressed by the guests who come in. And so all this has basically culminated in the past few decades we've seen um, this very glorified rock star culture. We see figures like David Chang, Anthony Bourdain, Gordon Ramsay, who really made a name for themselves, um, inspiring a whole generation of chefs to take that attitude into the kitchen and really be proud of this like rock star abusive lifestyle. Um, and like all of the headlines that you've mentioned, um, that's led to huge disruptions and scandals with the Me Too movement that is unfortunately not over at all. Um, with Black Lives Matter, we talked a lot about racial inequity, cultural appropriation of cuisines. Uh, with COVID, that certainly exacerbated uh, the frontline worker inequalities. We realized how unequal the industry was to them. And so now more than ever, we have one of the greatest worker shortages uh, that the restaurant industry has ever seen. People started really Realizing they don't have to put up with these crazy hours with this really low pay, they could actually move into different industries. And so it's harder than ever to get them to come back, which is a very reasonable decision on their part. Um, and so I think you've seen the conversation in the media change <clears throat> quite a bit as well in response to this. So we have TV shows now like The Bear and The Menu instead of Chef's Table that really dive into the realities of how psychologically and physically abusive it is to work in a kitchen. Um, and I think there's a lot more recent stories about toxic workplace environments um, with many of the restaurants that you called out in your introduction. And so I'm excited to be here today to really focus on how to build the next generation of restaurants to make it more sustainable, um, to make sure that the workers in this industry who work so hard to do what they do have mm -hmm. a fair place to work and a place that they're excited to show up every single day to serve the guests who come in. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. And and for, you know, recognizing that the, that pop culture side of the way so many um, people see the inside, the back end of the restaurant that we, they wouldn't see unless they were employees. So thank you for that. Uh, Andrew, you're the next one on the screen here. Thank you. Thanks for, for having me. This is very exciting. Uh, so I am co-founder of Hungry House. And the reason I'm here today is our flagship restaurant is located in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Uh, so we're very much part, proud to be part of that community. Um, Hungry House is really where I'm at right now is, is kind of the culmination of everything I've worked together, worked for uh, for the past two decades, really, in the restaurant business. Um, Hungry House really has a, a good shot at addressing a lot of these, a lot of these concerns and challenges that Robin so succinctly just described. Um, and on top of that, dealing with sort of the economic headwinds and the other external factors that are pressing inwards on the, on the industry. Um, Hungry House, in a nutshell, is an anti-ghost kitchen. Uh, and that is one of our biggest distinctions. And just to illustrate that distinction, uh, just put everybody on the same page. Ghost kitchens are somewhat recent of a development in the industry. They are essentially 
a restaurant without a dining room and without a front of the house staff. So born from the idea that you could create tremendous operational efficiencies in a restaurant by taking it off the avenue onto a more remote real estate turf uh, at a lower sort of carrying cost and not having to deal with guests. Guests, you know, create variability in your service. There's timing issues, there's different priorities and preferences. So if you, in theory, create a space where you're just cooking food that orders are coming through a machine and you're sending food out the door, you can save a lot of money. And people were very attracted to this idea starting sort of in the mid teens, uh, 2010s. Um, we'll go into more about why I think that's sort of missed the mark and not delivered on people's expectations. But what makes us an anti-ghost kitchen is that we exist very much in the public sphere. Uh, we have a lot of these efficiencies in terms of not having a dining room, but we do have windows you can see in the kitchen. Uh, we have a counter where you can in engage with our team and speak to our staff and get to know them. We're very much part of the community of people we serve. And I think that uh, does wonders for not only our team, you know, who actually is not just sort of in a black box mm -hmm. working remotely, uh, but the the guests who really get to get to speak with us and learn about us and and see, you know, uh, with confidence that the people making their food are happy, they're treated well, the kitchens are clean and organized, and I think that is a, is a big distinction for for what we do. Wonderful, wonderful. So thank you for sharing that because um, I, I, I I like that you consider yourself a ghost kitchen and have developed your model on that basis. Um, but I also appreciate you sharing about ghost kitchens because, you know, I would suspect that most of us in here know about it, but um, it, many don't, right? And even people that I've talked to in the industry, um, the first time that I brought people into a ghost kitchen from a colleague, they're like, oh, okay, now I get it. So you really are just creating food. I'm like, yeah, really creating food. So wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Jesse, share with us a little bit more about you and what brings you here today. Well, um, you know, it's sort of interesting because I guess it was over a year ago that I was asked to um, delve into cooking with cannabis. Um, and so the American Culinary Federation offers a course and I did some training and developed the course for this. And the, the interesting thing is that doing this and now teaching the course, I'm turning my students into advocates because while the state of New York has legalized cannabis, there's no infrastructure in place for restaurants. And so many issues come up, cross-contamination, dosing, um, banking, you know, right now in New York City, you can buy adult recreational use cannabis. You can go to Housing Works. There's only a few places that have it. And you have to pay cash or use a debit card because the federal government doesn't have a way for these businesses to do real banking. Mm -hmm. There's no infrastructure for restaurants. The state of New York has written laws, and those laws don't support restaurants yet as much as in the early stages of this. They were saying, wow, you know, you could have this on top of your pizza. No, not yet. So we're we're at the crest of the wave when it comes to cooking with cannabis and we're in the beginning of it. And I think what's fascinating is the students are beginning to realize what they need to do to make this a reality. Wonderful, wonderful. So I know that uh, whenever I've talked about the work that you're doing, I just get big questions. What? So we'll get into a little bit more detail about what that really means, you know, like, no, we don't have product on campus and that's part of the infrastructure stopping um, that. So thank you uh, all three for giving a, a much deeper introduction than what I was able to do with your bios. Um, so I'd like to start with just talking about the workplace in general. Um, so Robin, I'm, I'm going to start this um, one off for you. Um, I know you alluded to this a little bit in your intro, but um, what should we know about the makeup of the workforce? Like when we say the restaurant industry, who are we really talking about? 
Yeah, so it's it's certainly a hard population to to capture succinctly, um, but I would say generally most people think about it in terms of dividing across the fast food restaurants and the fast casual restaurants, which is certainly one entire demographic of workers. Um, and then you have the more upscale premium, and then of course all the way on the other end of the spectrum are the fine dining, which mm-hmm. take up a lot of media space, but frankly serve the smallest percentage of guests actually walking through the door every day. And so if you look at America as a whole, um, in the food service industry, actually one of the, the largest in industry employers are going to be the food service, the restaurant industry, particularly for that fast food, fast casual sector. Um, it's incredibly diverse. Um, it's actually one of the most diverse sectors of the workplace population. Um, a lot of these folks, this might be their first ever jobs. Um, the vast majority of them are going to be hourly workers. And so many, many of them in the front of house positions are working for tips. Um, And they're also younger than ever, particularly given the hiring shortage that we mentioned earlier. Uh, Restaurants are really searching for any avenue to hire and to recruit anywhere they can. So they're going straight to colleges, straight to high schools even. Um, And so that's something important to keep in mind, particularly as restaurants think about how can they modernize? How can they make their workforce more digitally savvy? Um, They have to figure out how to recruit and how to reach out to these workers. Um, The other thing that I would call out in terms of the diversity is that Again, back to this point of tipping, because the vast majority of these workers are uh, women or people of color, um, they face a lot of harassment, a lot of uh, racial discrimination or unconscious biases when it comes to tipping um, or really just interactions with the customers, interactions with other folks on the team. There's very often a divide where the the higher ranking you are, the higher tenured, it's often um, folks who are white and then the more entry level positions that maybe don't require as much speaking um, for a variety of reasons that are voluntary or involuntary. Um, will be folks of color. And so that's also something that I think a lot of the conversation is starting to recognize um, and certainly something we can take some more active steps towards balancing out. Wonderful, wonderful. You you mentioned something about the, the workforce and that um, for so many people, their first job is in a restaurant. So um, I know it's a set up as a conference and I can't see everybody like raising their hands, but I wonder if people put in the chat, if uh, working in a restaurant was your first job. Uh, what about Andrew, Robin, or Jesse? Was that <laughs> your first job? Yeah. All right. Yeah. I've got one hand raised there from Connor. So uh, I, I think that we would probably skew a little higher than the average population. But anyway, thank you for that. Um, so in many of our discussions in our own dining rooms, corporate tables, they, they focus on inequity. And um, as you expressed in New York Times essay, the hottest restaurants should be the ones that care about the work, their workers. Uh, that was just uh, published in February. So um, thank you for bringing that uh, to the New York Times readers. Um, how, um, you know, even though we talk about this, we might neglect to consider the restaurant worker in the conversations, you know, it's maybe it's a broader scale. So what actions could we take to ensure that our choices are supporting a positive, res- uh, positive restaurant workplace? Definitely. I mean, I think diners have a lot more power than they realize. And one of the impetus for me writing this article is I've spent some time working in front of house before. Um, and I, I remember receiving so many questions from our diners, incredibly detailed, incredibly knowledgeable about how did we source the beef? You know, uh, what was the environment that they were raised in? What did they eat? How much sunshine did they get? How much square footage? And rarely, if ever, did we get questions about the workers. Do we have paid time off? Do we have sick leave, especially during times of COVID? And so that was a really big imbalance that that really struck with me, particularly as the person serving you the food that you're asking so many questions about. Um, And so I would say as diners, I would certainly encourage you to use that voice and really choose to be more selective when you're making that decision. I think for the folks who have the privilege of choosing a very fancy place to go out, I promise you there is someone on the team who is more than willing to answer all the questions that you can ask them ahead of time. Um, And I think just doing a quick Google search, honestly, before you go out, looking at the reviews. Um, as you said, there's already so many headlines that are the first things that pop up when you do a quick Google. Um, other things are, you know, there's small signs that there's a 
a restaurant that's operating more progressively. So if you think about there's no tipping policy or if they add a mandatory living wage supplement, um, if you can see that they credit the chefs to particular dishes on the menu, um, if you look at their social media and they highlight um, a number of their team members, it means that these folks are proud and happy, willing to be featured. And so I think those are all small signs that, yes, take a little bit more effort, um, but certainly are going to be an important part of proving that there's this momentum from the diner side who have the dollar bills to vote with. Um, this is something that's important to the guests as well, not just the food. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. That's uh, good things to to look for, little triggers. Wonderful. Um, Andrew, uh, Andrew um, Robin just spoke about the consumer's point of view, right? What the consumer can do to make sure that they are um, you know, voting with their dollar, if you would. Um, what do you believe that restaurant professionals could do or are currently taking to improve the um, workplace environment? Well, I mean, something I stress <clears throat> in all my restaurants is that hospitality is not just an external sort of facing policy. You know, you have to, it has to reflect back on the teams you work with. Uh, anyone who comes into the restaurant space should be treated kindly and well and with respect. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a big part of it. And I think, for instance, our hiring policy uh, at Hungry House, it's not so much about finding mm -hmm. people with experience and industry background. It's more uh, attitude. You know, we want people who are optimistic and positive mm -hmm. and friendly and welcoming and that's a big step in that first in that first process of getting a job with us. So we want to build the team up from from the very foundation in that with with all this sort of ideas in context. Um, and then from there, it's it's you know for those restaurants that have the sort of capacity to flex their model, you want to work within you want to provide people realistic atmospheres in which to work. You know, a lot of these, you know, if you're going to go to one end of the dining spectrum, you have fine dining is an entirely unrealistic list of things to do every day when you show up as a chef. And that's, that, you know, part of where, where all the stress and, and energy comes from. Yeah. Um, if you can build a model that is, is manageable and, and appropriate for the teams that you're, that you're hiring, that's another way to start just building a, 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 just a more positive energy and one where you can people can live into their expectations and their roles and it doesn't create that sort of under undercurrent of stress yeah. that, that's, that's a big yeah that undercurrent stress right that that's a a, a lot of um why i think that people tip over the edge at, at some point so thank thank you for sharing your insight um and jesse i'd, I'd, I'd like to hear like you know, like me, you're around students and young people um, very often that are are aspirational, right? They stay there. Maybe they're working in the workplace. Maybe in the maybe they're working in a restaurant, but maybe they're not. But they're telling us that they want their careers to be that. So, are you seeing a shift at all in the demands of hospitality students and um, what they expect as a workplace environment, or at least a learning environment? You know, it's it, it, that's a great question because for the First time in a while, I have more students in Culinary One who are currently working in restaurants. So I think in one section I have four and in another I have uh, three who are actually currently working in places in, uh, one's in Staten Island, uh, one is in uh, Manhattan and one's in Queens. What's interesting is that we're starting to see a shift from that kind of old guard brigade system. I mean, that is moving. There's still remnants of it though. Um, you know, we have student absences because even though a student has said they have a, a class schedule, it can come up that they end up missing class because their boss will tell them, you've got to cover tonight. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't matter that they've already made an arrangement. And yet students are still committed to this kind of work. The other thing that's interesting is Students are more concerned about where their food is coming from than ever before. And they are concerned about their safety in the workplace. And I don't think we would have heard that a couple of years ago in the same way. I, I agree. I'm, I'm seeing um, students coming up and, and talking about it. And actually, you know, a few years back when um, that, that, 
first revelation of the court of master sommeliers um, uh, revealed, you know, the harassment, the rape, and the abuse that some of the people studying had to face. Uh, we talked about it in class, and uh, it, it, a lot of students thanked me for that um, because what they felt was that it gave them a place that they can feel safe to talk about something so that when it is a more high stakes environment, not that education is low stakes, but it's something like a job, if you have to pay your bills, like that definitely rises higher for many of our students. And they just appreciated the model and the opportunity and um, the place that they can talk and um, ask some questions even privately about human resources and do you trust them and, and where do you go and how long do you stay in a toxic environment? So. Um, yeah. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, did you, before we moved on to the next topic, is there anything in particular you want to share about, um, maybe the, uh, workforce that we haven't addressed yet? Yeah. I just like the layout, just, I think some nuts and bolts of, of sort of the operational realities of restaurants that I kind of feel like sometimes get pushed to the margins of this conversation. Um, and, not that all of this is a justify justification of anything, but you know, for instance, the example Jesse brought up of people being called in uh, on their days off to cover shifts. There's real restraints on 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 restaurants in terms of how much they can invest in labor and and the operations. They can't staff extra people, so it creates these environments which are, you know, I've done everything I can for the past many years to mitigate, but you know, calling people in on their days off is an unfortunate reality. And that's just one of the many unfortunate realities that workers in restaurants face. And then, you know, sort of to the point of Robin's customer asking questions about like why maybe do not provide insurance or paid time off. Those customers, I think, will have to be ready for the answer that maybe your salad needs to cost twice as much. Yes. Um, yes. And that is also on us as consumers to sort of confront that reality and our, our, our participation in, in the system as well. Yeah. I, 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 when having that conversation, I often ask mm -hmm. that to the person that maybe I'm dining with and I'm like, well, how much are you really willing to pay for that avocado toast that you're already saying is $12 for all of avocado toast? Like, well, if the person in the back had health insurance, then you're looking at a $17 avocado toast and, um, you know, I, it, not justifiable, right. But it is the consumer ready for that. And that's a big question, right? If, if uh, we look at the model of so many of these restaurants that are doing a, um, um, you know, no first service charge or just the prices are built in. I, I remember, you know, when I was even myself and I'm educated in this, I know that these are some things that we need to think about. But when I was looking at a couple of restaurants that I know don't do tipping at first, I was like, oh, that's really expensive. And then, you know, very quickly, I came to realize like, okay, Minus 20%. All right, there you go. But for the average consumer, I don't know if they're saying, okay, well, $25 for this, then the 20% tax or tip is equivalent to the $30 that it's on the menu for. So Robin, have you um, teased that out at all? Have you um, gone that way with like, what is the consumer willing to pay? Yeah. I mean, Andrew, I, I really appreciate you brought up that point because I would have liked to add as well, like one thing that guests can do is just be prepared to pay more. And this is a reflection of, you know, the true price of the meal, which is, of course, not just the ingredients. It's the labor, it's the effort, it's the time, it's the rent, it's all the hidden things that go in behind the scenes. And that really is one of the last frontiers that we are trying to overcome. I think there are many restaurants, quite well-known ones, that have tried to switch to a no-dipping model, and they've unfortunately gone back um, mm -hmm. because they just weren't able to make the economics work. And these are like, they had an entire business team staffed behind them. They had really good PR for a while. Um, and so I think that was not perhaps the most optimistic signal. Um, that being said, it's absolutely still worth trying. Um, but I would say as consumers, um, we have seen a little bit more, especially in the post-COVID I would say some trends of people eating out less, but being prepared to pay more when they are going out for those meals. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you for adding that, uh, both of you. Uh, I'd like to shift a little bit and talk um, about the kitchen itself. So um, Andrew um, 
in the intro, you talked about, you know, being an anti-ghost kitchen and um, consumers experience meals cooked outside of the home, you know, in a variety of settings and have been doing so for a very, very long time, but long before the concept of ghost kitchens um, came to be more prevalent. Um, but uh, what should we know about engaging the consumer in the a restaurant quality meal, but not sitting down at a restaurant? How do you approach that? This has become a very multifaceted uh, subject. <laughs> you know, we can reach customers. The traditional restaurant model, you essentially had to walk by it to find out about it. And, you know, if it was good, you came back. Um, now we have social media. We have influencers we have all different, different various ways to get our names out there and and these third-party platforms are one of them as well and so ghost kitchens specifically rely entirely on third-party platforms and social media to get their names out there they don't exist so there's no way you could just happen by it um as it turns out i think customers aren't all that comfortable with restaurants that they can't just go to or see or be, you know, and just even like walk by. Um, so that's one of the things we sort of address with our model at Hungry House. Uh, we give them the opportunity to, to come see us, but we we behave like our ghost kitchen as well. So to that end, we, the restaurant industry, and I think a big challenge that the ghost kitchen industry faces is that it's so reliant on the third party System and by third party is I mean Uber Eats, DoorDash, Grubhub, these delivery services that um, market your food and then organize delivery. They take a thirty percent cut, right, of, of sales. Um, so you're essentially creating a restaurant model where you've saved all this money by getting off the avenue and onto a side street. You're not paying as much rent, but then you're giving up thirty percent of your of your revenue to this platform. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, really just kind of chasing the same numbers. Um, and you don't have the visibility of the storefront. So you rely solely on those third-party apps or do you employ any delivery people that maybe um, will go out from uh, Hungry House? So we do, we have many different channels through which we serve our food. Um, we rely in part on the third-party delivery systems, but we have given our our core concept, which is working with creators and the who have brands and social media, so you sort of the creator economy. Mm. Uh, they come to us, and we when we launch their menus in our restaurant, we sort of take in their community with that. So we grow with our with our influencers, uh, and those influencers can drive their their fans and their community towards mm. our, our native platform, which is our our own um, proprietary online uh platform so that way we're not paying out that 30 percent to to the door dashes and the uber eats of the world uh, we're getting those customers indirectly so we're fortunate enough to have that as the as the bulk of our online business and we're, we can use the third parties to just sort of expand reach mm -hmm. and uh recognition of the brand mm -hmm. uh, then that i guess uh segues into very nicely. Um, another question that I asked was going to ask you, it's um, about your, uh, not the business model, but the marketing model, right? It's, so it's not that of a traditional restaurant. It sounds like more that you're following a, a different um, consumer product model. So, um, but also in your unique case, like it, maybe you use your kitchen for different um, food products throughout the day, depending on the time of day. Is that, is that correct? Uh, we run all of our menus simultaneously. Okay. So what's one of the other really cool things about, about what we do, and frankly, this is the reason that drew me in, was because we work with creators, they, we, we find the creators who have these great brands, and but no real storefronts to sell their own food. We bring them in and market their food for them. We create the, we create the food and, and sell it. Um, it allows us to work with creators from very distinct backgrounds and tell their story. So where many of ghost kitchens, uh, their menus originate in sort of a, a spreadsheet. They sort of look at opportunities and, and gaps in cuisines and, and um, perceived demand in markets and say, go create a taco menu or go create an Indian menu. 
and in in this case we're bringing in this talent who uh in often, many cases were raised in these different cultures we have a great filipino chef a mexican chef named tony steeped in these traditions and and really understand the inherent qualities and nuances to the cuisine and then we do our part in translating that into an operational menu so it allows us to serve food that is diverse and covers a lot of territory but in a very authentic way it's not me creating these menus it's it's tony it's woldy it's mariah and and we just get to sort of steward them out into the world so then how do you find the Tonys and the Mariahs? Um, you know, how do you attract workforce to your your establishment? Uh, the the creators themselves, we've been fortunate enough to establish a really good reputation in, in executing on their vision. Um, that's something that's one of my most important parts of my job is, is meeting with the chefs and finding ways to translate what they find important about their food into, into reality. Um, so we've we've developed a good reputation, and and they're sort of coming to us now. We're we're very much in that community of, uh, you know, Instagram, and TikTok creators. Um, and our team, from from that point of view, like I said before, we're really just looking for people who are good people, happy people, and who want to learn. And just even if they're only in it for a year or two, like they don't want to be chefs. Most of them don't want to be chefs like for very long. Um, and that's okay. But what we offer is is a good environment, an opportunity to like really get to know different cuisines in a, in a genuine and authentic way and learn some transferable, marketable, professional skills in the process. And if they go off to do something else, that's fine. Some of them stay, some of them don't. But we just we um, just look for people who are complementary to the to that sort of approach. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, having that diversity allows for uh, some complexity, I'm sure, too, in, in what you do. So wonderful, wonderful. Um, Robin and Jesse, did you uh, maybe want to ask Andrew a question of your own or did you uh, want to add anything about what uh, your experience with a ghost kitchen, anti-ghost kitchen experience might be? Yeah, I mean, I'd be curious, based on the differentiations that you mentioned, Andrew, um, what has been the feedback from the chefs? Particularly, I imagine some of them have perhaps worked um, in some of the more traditional ghost kitchens in the past. Um, so how have they found that difference um, for them? Are you speaking with about the creators? Yes, yes. So th this is funny. This is another interesting thing about the industry and, and the workforce is that many of these chefs have not ever worked in restaurants and uh -huh. they don't want to. And <laughs> I can't blame them, right? Because it, it's, it's not the best lifestyle. Um, it's getting better, I feel like, but it's definitely not where it needs to be. Um, so they, they've they created their cuisines, they've developed their brands outside of the restaurant space. And they're just really happy to have their food out in the world. And they love to come, you know, we love to have them in the restaurants. They come in and they work with us sometimes. We develop new dishes together, get the team involved. So it's a very, it's a very cool, fluid environment. We sort of friends let let them use our spaces. They have events to cater, and um, so there's a lot of uh, back and forth in that relationship. That's wonderful. Um, so Jesse, uh, what's happening with cannabis? Like, oh, well, first I I actually had a question for. Oh, Rob. wonderful, wonderful. Go ahead. Um, so. If we think about, you know, the, the forces in a restaurant and where the, the drivers are on cost in New York City and what we've seen, and I'd like to know from your perspective, it's usually the rental cost. It's not usually the food cost. It's not really the worker cost. It's it's all those other drivers, such as the uh, the rent. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's that's quite spot on and perhaps one of the biggest benefits of the ghost kitchen model, as Andrew had talked about, of, you know, being able to eliminate a lot of that space that you don't need for tables and chairs um, and the dining room area. Um, and so I think that is often in a support of why we need to raise the prices. It's not necessarily a matter of cutting costs, because, again, that will come at the expense often of the workers. 
um, in terms of trimming pennies there, but really can we educate the diners? Can we create a next generation of consumers who are willing to pay um, higher margins to basically cover what is a very reasonable ask to support the, the workers who are serving them? Right, because I think many times diners don't realize they they think the price they're paying is for the food and for the work, and it's really the place they're sitting in. Yes, exactly. I think the most common uh, comment you'll hear is like, oh, you know, I could have made this myself at home for a quarter of the price, which may be true. I will question that. Um, but at the same time, you know, what you're missing out on is the service, the hospitality, right? The server, the hostess who greets you when you walk in, the manager who remembers your name, someone who knows how to properly pour that glass of wine for you. That's something that you can't necessarily recreate at home. The, the experience, right? We're exactly. Paying. Yeah. Um, but Karen, you're going to ask me a question about cannabis. I, I was, I was. Um, and it, you and I have had these conversations before, but now we're in a, in a more public situation. Um, what's going on with the education? Like when, when we talk about responsible, you know, teaching students responsible cannabis cooking, like, okay. explain what that means. Cause I, I a right. lot of people are thinking that you've got weed there and you don't. I mean, honestly, the first the first session, really the second session, I looked at the history of, of the drug laws in the U.S. because I thought if we want to know why we're here today, we have to know how we got there. And it really started from the time of prohibition. Um, the other thing is that states want the money, Okay but they haven't put in the infrastructure to make it happen responsibly, right? They want the tax dollars. Um, and we don't yet have a way to properly dose people in a restaurant. I mean, we, we can't use the same blood alcohol that we use when we're serving liquor, right? We either have a, a bartender who's counting drinks or we have visible intoxication and we don't serve. We have people who know their two drink limit or whatever it is. Cannabis is not the same, right? It takes almost 45 minutes to an hour for it to metabolize in the body. So if you're dining with cannabis, anything with THC has to come first and the CBDs have to come later. And you can't have a guest say to you, hey, I smoke every day, I'm fine, no. You can't say, oh, sure, I'll give you 100 milligrams, no problem. And the standard for this is not set. It's just, it's kind of like the Wild West out there. The other thing that's like open is that we have decades of people experimenting with cannabis and food, right? Mm -hmm. How far back was it that people were just like throwing it in their brownie mix, right? The hash brownies, yeah. Seeds, twigs and all, right? And they got an effect. And people don't understand now that there's a chemical process, decarboxylation, where you go from the acid content of cannabis, the THCA, and go to THC. Are people going to do this in a restaurant? Are they, you, you can get the equipment. Sure, you could do it in Well, how efficient is that extraction? And what are you giving the diner? How do you separate your cannabis from everything else so that you don't cross contaminate, right? These are all things I called Serve Safe months ago to say, you know, you guys need to develop a course on, on this. They're like, eh, later, we'll worry <laughs> about it later, right? My it's next coming. plan is to write to the Cannabis Control Board because they have rules for growers, they have rules for distributors, and they hyped up the cannabis on your pizza, but there are no rules for it. It's important. It's yeah. important. I, I, I foresee the day where, you know, and, and, and again, just learning from what you just said right now, um, that it takes 45 minutes, right? So it, when I'm teaching the wine class that I teach at City Tech, I had always said, okay, so now you're serving wine throughout the meal and now your dessert has a little bit of a drizzle um, and there's oils in there. Now what happens? How do you gauge that? And now listening to you that it may not even be um, that dessert that the restaurant would want to use. It would want to be in the appetizer. And how do we toss that into whatever we're right. serving at that point? And um, 
yeah, that but- time delay will in- create problems. Right, because you would then theoretically do the non-intoxicating but still psychoactive CBDs at the end of the meal uh-huh. and let's say throughout the meal. Um, but even there's an issue like if you have THCA, which is in its natural form, and let's suppose you say, well, somebody doesn't want to get intoxicated and I'm just going to, let's say, microplane it on top of their salad. Well, if it was held in an environment where it was exposed to light and heat, it's partially decarbed naturally. And so there's no guarantee that you are not going to give somebody an intoxicating dosage, even if you haven't used heat and time to drive the acids off and potentialize the psychoactive and intoxicating properties. So, and, and you know what, line cooks are not gonna make that decision, right? Line cooks, their job is to just bang out food. It isn't yeah. to say, oh, you need one milligram of this, right? So I think initially this is going to be maybe fine dining. Okay. And eventually when, and there are people out there waiting for the opportunity to make something that's the equivalent of I buy Valrona chocolate, yeah. right? I buy the expensive Valrona Fevs and I'm going to take half a Fev and break it in half and it's going in your sauce, right? Because- you say that, but yeah, I mean, you say that, but then I'm thinking of California and, you know, just walking in and getting a cookie and a gummy and walking out onto the street, right? And then and, and mm-hmm. we can do that in Colorado and here now. And um, so will it, you know, now, now you're talking about a different type of education with the workforce, right? And, and Robin, you spoke about this earlier, you know, when I, what, the first question I asked you was like, what do you mean by the workforce? Like, well, if it's a quick service, restaurant as compared to a fine dining restaurant, that skill level will need to be, uh, or, or yeah, the, the skill level will be different for those who can debonicate chicken, who can take a piece of chicken, throw it into a fryer. Um, mm-hmm. So I think that this education level too, will be doing that. So, so, so with that said, you know, you do have a, a, a class, I think of 25 students about now, what, what seems to be their goals in taking this course? Well, it's interesting. I have people who are what called legacy, right? They've been in the cannabis field for a long time. Um, And then I have people who just want to get high, (laughs) right? (laughs) They want, because we're all different as chefs, right? Some of us care about where our food comes from and we're all about the flavor of the food, right? Mm -hmm. And cannabis is no different. Some people want to potentialize that THC and they're going for it, right? But the, but the plant itself has so many other possibilities, right? You have terpenes, right? All the terpenes that are the same ones that are in fruits and vegetables, right? Those same aromatic compounds. And they have benefits, right? They have flavor, they have the aroma. And so maybe some people will be the kind of cannabis chef that wants that and some THC in the beginning of the meal. And then kind of like what's called the entourage effect, where I take the total effect of the plant and carry it through the meal, not all of it intoxicating, but some of it psychoactive. So there's a lot to think about. Yeah. Um, It definitely is a new world for us. Um, Robin or Andrew, um, have either of you ventured into this area? And with Rob, with Richard coming up, I'm thinking that we're reaching near the end of our time, but I'd I'd love to hear from Robin or Andrew to see if they ventured into exploring responsible cannabis cooking. I I have not, but I I did just hire, uh, hire somebody who worked with the catering outfit that um, I was I was pleasantly surprised to hear how thoughtful they were about dosing people, mm-hmm. and they sort of had little questionnaires that you had to fill out before you came to the dinner and experience with marijuana exposure to it and like sort of other metrics. Um, so it seems to me it's probably kind of a lot like alcohol. Really, there's some regulation, but there's also a whole lot of just sort of you guys do it. Um, but there is, I think, a parts of the industry that are taking it very seriously and trying to create a process with some sort of scientific basis. 
Yeah, I haven't tried it yet. Um, but Jesse, I think a lot of the language that you used, um, particularly around, you know, fine dining as kind of one of the pioneers of experimenting it reminds me a lot of the language I've heard um, in the VC space around, you know, when alternative proteins first got introduced to the market, no one knew what it was, how to cook it, what to do with it. And so it really started to take off when fine dining kitchens were the ones who presented it in front of the guests. You had this trusted source that said, hey, we've cooked this. It's going to taste good, we promise. And only then it started to trickle down into, you know, Whole Foods. And then it moved into Trader Joe's and it moved into Safeways. And then now White Castle and Burger King, McDonald's, you know, every fast food restaurant has it. But it slowly gained acceptance from the very top when you had these experts in the field to really educate the consumers of this very new novelty that was hitting the market. The only, the only thing I would add to that is that what we're seeing out there is not really full THC. It's what's legal because hemp has 0.3% of THC in it, which is why that can be out and be sold with CBDs, right? That's what's legal. Anybody who's doing catering and they're serving more than 0.3, they're in a big legal gray area, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And you do, and we have, there's, there's a section on, on the law as well. Um, so Richard, did you have some questions to ask for us or are you telling us that our time is near end? Okay, I actually <laughs> both. But, so I would like a culminating uh, uh, question. And that is, so what we, um, uh, the topic is hospitality, you know, in a time of play. And we've looked at, uh, how survival, and we've looked at some change. So what, if anything, so what of these changes that you have been talking about uh, do you think came from COVID? And are there uh, COVID, have there been COVID changes that you think will last? So how has COVID permanently change the industry or has it or has it not and then there's that question and then i just want to say i was glad that uh robin picked up on the earlier thing about the idea of hospitality and the greek word xenia and how that uh is so important a human concept this whole idea of being a host and knowing what to do for your guests and being a guest and knowing how to respect your host and the uh, what we owe to each other through this concept. And that is ancient, uh, that whole idea. But back to the other question. COVID, has it changed things permanently? If so, what? Well, I'll say just to your point of this hospitality being an age old uh, idea, Nothing, nothing we're doing is new really right now, but I think the pandemic provided us a window in which to act on some of these things where just, you know, speaking from the full service restaurant industry background, they didn't want to see technology in the restaurant. Customers didn't want tablets. Um, I, people, didn't, people didn't look to Instagram to see where they're going to eat. Um, but the pandemic kind of gave us this clean slate as an industry to, to apply these new technologies and like the excuse sort of to, to test these ideas out. And some of them will stick and some of them won't, but I don't think with, without the pandemic it would have been harder for anything other than fast casual can kind of iterate differently, but full service restaurants have a very traditional model and it allowed us to, to try new things. I think dining sheds, I'm happy and they're doing new rules I've heard to finalize dining sheds. I, I think that was the first the first session today. Yeah, I think that that's a good thing, right? And I would add, you know, there's two, two trends that I'm really seeing. One's the downside is this hiring shortage mm -hmm. um, that we've seen and has really impacted every restaurant across every tier. Um, but more optimistically, I think the COVID COVID has really 
made people realize, A, how much they miss and value restaurants, and B, how hard the industry is for the people who run it. Um, and so hopefully, I think those two trends will really couple together, and so that diners have more appreciation, um, and also workers feel more empowered to ask and to receive what they deserve in the workplace. Yeah. Uh, if, if I may take a moment. Yes, to you get the point. last word, Karen. Thank you. Thank you. And um, you've done a great job of moderating. Oh, thank you. Well, <laughs> I have a wonderful panelists, so it was easy. Um, so, But thank you for arranging that. Um, it, I think of like, you, you know, like if you wake up in the morning and like you're jolted awake and you, you feel a little off all day, even if you're optimistic, even if you know that you're going to make a good you know, positive change and stuff like that. That's what I think the restaurant industry is is at this moment. I think that we haven't quite settled down from that shakeup um, that that we've had, um, and all of the things that were mentioned here, right? So the the cooking with cannabis that was that was happening anyway, right? That that the the pandemic might have slowed it down, but now it's jolted. And how do we get to those students who need to be educated about this? Um, when it comes to, you know, food delivery systems, they were here much longer than the pandemic uh, had an impact, but they needed to get to people in a way that um, uh, they hadn't ever reached before. Um, and I think that the full service restaurants took lessons from the ghost chick kitchens and, and such like that. Um, and then as the, for, for the workforce, I just, um, I just, I, I look at our students and I just think about how important it is to educate them about finding their voice so that they can speak up. And, and we know that it's still happening. Um, but I, I'm just, I'm grateful. I'm grateful in one respect that some of the inequities that I faced when I was, um, in, in my early career ventures are not being faced by as many people now. But on the other hand, I recently was at uh, the CCAP gala and I started talking to the chef and she was visibly pregnant. You know, maybe she was like eight months or something like that. And I celebrate, I'm like, oh my goodness, I worked, I, I worked until Friday. I gave birth on Monday. You can do this. And then I walked away and I said, why are we still doing this? Why are we still beating up our bodies? Like, what is it in the workplace that we as, as leaders have not said stop for a moment and make space for everybody, but don't make everybody have to feel as if they have to work on a Friday and give birth on a Monday. I, I would hope that we can change there. So um, th th those are my points. Um, oh, but then very well very well taken. Yeah. And um, I would just like to thank you all uh, for a very stimulating, interesting conversation. Um, it is uh, a, a wonderful value. And, and I wonder now, after today's conversation, if we will be seeing a course proposed uh, at, uh, at City Tech in the hospitality management on uh, labor law and lay the yeah. laws of labor organizing yeah. and and the like yeah but, we um we actually do we have we have a course already with we have a labor go, environment course and and um it, it's already works on that now is it you know it, it touches yeah. a lot of things but labor law is definitely part of it so okay uh thank you very much to everyone out there uh, who's attended. Thank you very much for coming, for joining this. And this will, um, uh, has been recorded. And if uh, your friends and relatives didn't make it today, they could go on the BWRC uh, website and you'll be able to uh, view this, uh, these conversations. So I uh, thank you all. Thank you Karen and Andrew and Jesse and Robin uh, coming all the way. We had someone from um, from England today, and we have someone from California today. Uh, that's the one good thing about, um, I guess, a, a, about Zoom conferences. The bad thing is we can't feed you as we normally would at BWRC. Although this would have been a tricky one to feed uh, so many people with restaurants, but. Who knows how he would have done that. Okay, so thank you, everybody, and I'll uh, adjourn our annual conference. Come back again.